What's happening, everyone? Happy New Year. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. First show of 2022. How about that? Hope everybody's well on this shout-out Sunday. See everybody out there. Yo, Lori Dawn, what's up? Shout-out to women in the pit. Lori Dawn out in Rhode Island. You can relate to this one, right? Rhode Island. Martha's Vineyard, you know. What's happening in Italy? Maurizio, all right, good. Shark, shark. <laughs> exactly. We're going to have some fun today. Really looking forward to it. Happy New Year, Gary. What's up, Dom? Good to see you. Good to see everybody. Yes, Darren, we have life. This is going to be great. Goddamn electric. That's right, John. Looking forward to it. Yep. What's happening? Well, you know what? Let me mention a couple of... Uh, Real quick, the next four shows that are going on. Uh, A week from today, Sunday, January 9th, Jay Navarro from Suicide Machines is on the show. That should be cool. A week from Wednesday, this is going to be great. Old school rock and roll manager Peter Leeds is going to be on the show. He managed Blondie, The Runaways. Roberta Flack, Judy Collins. This is going to be great. Wednesday, January 19th, Gary G. Man Sullivan from Cro Mags, B52s, Bernie Worrell. And then Wednesday, January 23rd, BMX legend and musician Rick Thorne will be on the show. So lots of good stuff coming up. Get your shoes and socks on, kids. It's right around the corner. I know what you're thinking. I am thinking the same thing. We cleared the deck a little bit. What's up with this guy? What's up? How's everybody doing? Well, what's up with that clipboard behind you, man? I'm in the union office right now. It's the quietest place. I'm a union man. Union strong. Union strong. You Ooh, know baby. what? You t- you listen, tell your friggin' union to to to, to friggin' uh, get me some slurred. Wi-Fi. <laughs> get some Wi-Fi for Christ's sake, man. Yeah, it's only with this phone. It's not with the iPad, so. Christ almighty. My apologies. But I'm back at work. I had a, I had a little bout with the uh, Omicron, but uh, I'm all better now. So, Well, it, what, what were you out of the mix for like a week, right? You were out for like a week, right? Here we go. Here we go. All right. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Listen, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Uh, with yes. photo of the day, but l- here we go. Photo of the day. Bam. There you go. Wrong answers only, please. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is interesting. And, and there's a reason that we're going with, with, with this photo today. So what do we got? Come on. And if we could is just clarify. It? That yeah, this is ahead. a guest photographer, by the way, because this is yes, right. This is a guest. This is a guest uh, guest photographer, and there's a reason I'm going with this. And you are frozen again, but it's a, it, but you look good. Um, I'll unfreeze. Is it Justin Bieber? Is it Johnny Rotten? Is it Brian Adams? Is it is it Blondie? <laughs> is it? Is it Dave Mustaine. Okay. Is it Gigi Allen? Here is, is it Justin Timberlake? Here is a, another one. Am I still frozen? You are frozen, bro. Sign off and sign back on. Here is another one from that roll of film, which I will explain to you. Some of you have seen some of these before. Um, Not this necessarily, but there is a reason that um we're going with this is it is it Kiefer Sutherland is it Annie Lennox is it Bon Jovi is it Ace Freely hey there we go is it ICP <laughs> is it is it great pick all right one more one more and I'm gonna tell you what this is kids one more. 
Here we go. This, here we go. All right. Is it Tony James and Billy Idol? Is it Billy Idol? Is it... Is it Billy Idol? Is it Great Pick? Is it, <laughs> is it Billy Idol? Is it Gen X? Yes. This is... Why don't you... you why don't you tell us what this is? Well, this is this is Generation X. God, this has got to be like, is this pre-first album? Uh, the date on it, is, I'll tell you what the date on I it mean, is. He looks like a baby here. Yeah, absolutely. The, These so, pictures are so good, by the way. Thanks. They're so, I mean, they're so vivid. They really, you know, you don't really see pictures of Billy at this point very often. Yeah. So the story with this, yes, it's Generation X. And a friend of ours passed away recently. Um, the news came out yesterday. Chris Corkum, who was a lover of the show. He was always in the chat room. He's in my film, uh, the Boston Hardcore film, uh, XXX All Ages XXX, the Boston Hardcore film that I directed. He's in that. He was part of the early Boston Hardcore scene. He loved Billy Idol. He was friends with... Uh, with Billy, and as a tribute to him, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, put up a couple of these pictures. Um, Chris Corkum, you know, uh, really, really uh, kind soul, and uh, you know, he was he was always always in the chat room and really supportive of the show. These photos, as some of you may know, um, a while back. I was gifted, I was gifted 3,500 negatives from 1977 to London by a guy named Greg Smith. Greg Smith uh, was, um, I met him when he was uh, a cameraman for my father, uh, when my dad was doing commercials. And later on, when I started my film production company and I produced these uh, Onyx Slam and the Biohazard stuff um, with Paris Mayhew directing a lot of them. Greg Smith was our director. Uh, uh, excuse me, was our cameraman. Uh, excuse me, Paris Mayhew directed, I produced. Greg Smith was a cameraman. And a couple of years ago, um, he gifted me 3,500 uh, of these negatives from 1977 London. And those Billy Idol pictures were... Uh, you know, part of it. Uh, incredible, incredible stuff. So we're putting a book together of that. But um, rest in peace, Chris Corkum. And uh, also uh, Robert Bruce passed away, um, who was a friend of Rap Bones. He was on uh, the show Comic Book Men. And man, it's just in the air. Sadly, I'm going to Scott Koenig's funeral tomorrow out in uh, Scott Koenig, who managed Biohazard. Um, going to his funeral tomorrow out in Staten Island. So there's a lot of it in the air, man. Yes, Larry, of course, man. It's a tribute to Chris. Chris was a Chris, Chris was a kind soul uh, from Salem, Massachusetts. He was friends with the Discharge guys, and he was close with Billy Idol. So, so there you go. Yeah. So that's that, man. Um, anything you uh, anything you want to shout out there, Mister Mister? Uh, I've been where? Oh yeah, yo. Yo, got to shout out Betty White, too. Betty White passed away. Yeah, 99. Betty White was hard, 99. 99. Yep. And she worked, like, the whole time. Yeah. You know, God bless her. Yeah, man. Yeah. All right. You're frozen, but do you want to you wanna shout anybody out? Nah, I'm just eager to get this show rolling. I'm going to kick a front seat here. All right, I'll talk to you in a bit. All right, there you have it. This is... The New York Hardcore Chronicles live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Reel, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chachos Tacos, Generation Records. New York Hardcore Comics opened in 2013, selling comic books, punk rock, and hardcore memorabilia, toys, statues, skateboard decks, tapes, vinyl, and all things horror. We love helping bands push their demos and new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music. We have in-store events like Magic the Gathering and Warhammer tournaments, plus meet and greets with bands and some live performances. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Find us online through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay. Located at 117 Main Street in Dobbs Ferry, New York. 
www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com. Come on now, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards. Located in Lakewood, Colorado is the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and yes, metal. Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of records, CDs, shirts, stickers, patches, and accessories between Chicago and Los Angeles. From the pit to the ditch, they got your back. Get in touch with them at www.chainreactionrecords.com. One more for the road. How about DTFM Vinyl Distro? It's a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore metal, and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's industry. Yo, it must be, it must be cold in Fargo, North Dakota right now. Shop in person or online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com, where the motto is death to false metal. Uh, that said, just real quick, before we bring our guest on, I want to mention that the New York Hardcore Chronicles Volume 1, 1980 to 1989 is available. It ships the next day. You can own this bit of this exciting bit of history. Uh, it's available at www.stonefilmsnyc.com, 2495 plus shipping. Buy the book, support the show. Don't be scared. There's a lot of great stuff in it. And they're going to sell out pretty fast. Not as fast as the first uh, uh, run. The first pressing was sold out in three days. This one will probably take probably three weeks. So, so there you go. Uh, let's clear the deck and uh, let's bring our guest on. Let me see. Let's clear it. Boom, boom, boom. Everybody okay? Upstate Rick, how you doing, man? Hope you're well, buddy. Yeah, well, don't sleep on it, Jamie. Don't talk about that you're going to buy it. Buy it. <laughs> so there you go. Um, all right. Yeah, let's do it on this. This first Sunday in, in 2022. All right. Here we go. Let's clear the deck. What the heck? All right. Today's guest is an American drummer and songwriter hailing from the Bronx in New York City. He is known for his work with the bands SOD and for over 36 years, 10 studio albums seven live albums, and numerous world tours. He has been in the drum seat for one of the big four, the thrash metal band Anthrax. He is also a film enthusiast and memorabilia collector. Please welcome, coming on the show today to talk about his passion for the iconic film Jaws, Mr. Charlie Benante. Hey, man. Hey, hey Drew. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, buddy. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, that's a great introduction. I was like, wow, that many years. I was like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, you've been at it a long time, man. You know? I know, since I was a kid. <laughs> I guess you know nothing else, right? I mean, this is all, it's its always been your whole adult life, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's something to like, uh, I always think about that, like when a tour ends and I get home, and then like eight o'clock comes and I should be doing something. You know what I mean? I'm like all right. <laughs> hyper and stuff. I was like, I should be in catering or something by now. You know, nobody's, right. nobody's cooking for me tonight. You know, I, I guess, you know, you, you, you've been at it a long time, but you, you know, when you and your nephew, um, Frankie was on the show, right? He, he, yeah. he, he was talking about when you guys, you guys grew up together in the same house, how you guys would come off tour and then like, there was no separation. You'd end up at the, I thought it was cool. You'd end up at the dinner table right, yeah. with your mom, with your mom. <laughs> exactly. Like <laughs> you just couldn't get away from the guy, you know? No, that's true. We would, uh, back in the early days when we didn't have our own places, we would finish a tour and, you know, take everything back to my mom's house where, you know, <laughs> I would be in my room, he'd be in his room. And, um, but yeah, that's, that's how we grew up, you know, and I, I don't think we even thought about it back then. It was just, yeah. that was it. That was life, you know? Yeah. So you guys, um, let's talk briefly about, about the band a second. Um, you guys just played, uh, looks like a really, geez, man, that stadium looks like it goes on forever. Where the heck was that? So that was in Daytona. That's the oh, racetrack. Oh, 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 that's Daytona. That's Daytona Speedway. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, um, okay. Dude, that was a trip. When we first pulled in, you know, you go over the track. And sure. That thing is so high. 
um, it's like almost like a wall, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, so you can understand that they have to be traveling pretty fast in order to, you know, go around that thing without tipping over. So it, it was a trip just, just being there. Um, but that show, that was the last show of the year for us. And we, it, that ended on such a great, like, high. And uh, just, it, it was just a great day. The bands, the other bands, they were just, everybody was just awesome that day. Just wanting to play, you know, it was great. This is, this, this was Rock, Rockville? Welcome to Rockville, yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't help but notice that you played on the day with it was with Leonard Skinnerd, Metallica, Leonard Skinnerd, Mudvayne, Mastodon, Anthrax. That's yeah, yeah. Did, did, did you see? Did you see Leonard Skinnerd play? <laughs> I I didn't see Skinnerd on that day, but we had played shows previously. You know, like overseas, we were on the same festivals and got right. to talk to those guys and watch them. And uh, I'll tell you one thing: when you're there and you're hearing those Skinnerd songs. Yeah. right in front of you dude it just does something to you for it, sure it, it's just mesmerizing you know and uh yeah it's great the that that that's one of the legendary bands that there's such a history there with that band just the story you could do a whole show on skinner yeah you know what i mean because it's, it's just i'm a amazing. fan i've 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 always loved I've always loved Skinner and and you know I, I've said I've said it before on the show that I grew up I grew up in the Bronx I grew up in you know as a teenager I, I was in the Kingsbridge Spite and Dival section of the Bronx and when 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 I and you and I are are the, basically the same age yeah. you, you, yeah. you have like four or five months older than me let uh, Southern Rock was huge where I grew up in the Bronx like and yeah. I went to I went to Kennedy High School and like everyone loves Southern Rock. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and that's the weird thing about it because you can be in school with other uh, students and you could love yes you can love the yeah. outlaws you can love you know zeppelin and it was yeah. just such a such an eclectic uh, you know a, a bunch of, of of songs and music and bands so it was it was cool i mean i grew up in in the area right over the throgs neck bridge that's where i right. grew up which is weird because uh, Scott grew up on the opposite side of the bridge, right over what, the bridge. What was that? What 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 is that area called on the other side of the Throgs Neck? What is that called? So I'm in Throgs Neck, and I think Scott was in Bay. Uh, was it Bay Boulevard? Or, so uh, so was th the area was called Throgs Neck. Throgs Neck, yeah. And then there was uh, a, another area called Edgewater, and. Uh, uh, yeah, it was like that was yeah. our area in the Bronx. Um, so yeah. it, it was only like maybe 20 minutes from Yankee Stadium. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Shouting out Gary G Man Sullivan. What's up? Team Bronx is right. And we'll see you, <laughs> Gary. We'll see you, Gary, when, when you're on the show coming up. So let's talk a little let, let's let's get into it. Let, let's jump into it. And uh, let's start off like like you said, we're about the same age. And when, when when you grew up, were, were movies a part of your upbringing? Upbringing was was it a part of your culture? Uh, you know, family wise. Well, back in the day when we, we were growing up, we didn't have VCRs or anything like that. So, in order for us to watch a movie twice, you would have to stay in the theater and watch it multiple times. You know what I mean? <laughs> or or if they would give it on TV, television. You know, you'd, you'd watch it then. But I grew up in a house with four sisters. So and then we had my cousins who were four, uh, three boys. So either I was there or I was home. And my earliest, you know, um, the thing I remember the most about being young and watching movies uh, was being introduced to like just strictly horror movies and mm. Abbott, and, Abbott and Costello. Sure. Um I think they were the gateway into horror with like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man, stuff like that. And, you know, bam, I was hooked. Um, and then that, that, I think that's, in, that's interesting. Just as a side note, Jerry Garcia from the Grateful Dead says his gateway was Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Yeah. I, like I, I, that, I, as a child, that film, they ask it, like, I, I've read it, they, they ask him, like, what film really resonated and he cites that film as being like really pivotal for him interesting well because because it was all, all the monsters in the movie yeah um, yeah <laughs> and, and it was Abbott and Costello so it wasn't that scary but yet there was right. elements of you know horror so <laughs> um so from there 
it, it just it just went on to every I had to know everything about you know every monster and everything like that. And then I would say the Planet of the Ape movies were the ones that kind of got me really interested in movies, like going to the movies, you know. And that was it for me, you know. I was hooked. There it is. My my mom. Uh, it took me to see a marathon of the Planet of the Apes movies. It was all five movies, and I'll never forget it, man. Just shoot, we got there at eleven a.m. We were there till fucking seven o'clock at night. It and your and your mom sat through all five. Yeah, and I remember I remember her leaving to call the house to say, you know, telling my one sister, "I'm going to be here for a bit," you know. So you got to get there. <laughs> but um, but that that was it, and. Once Jaws and The Exorcist, I think, hit me, yeah. that was it, man. I was, like, hooked on movies. I became enthralled with, like, movie making. I had to know everything about the movie, you know? I was just, it consumed me. We, we were 13 years old when, when, when Jaws came out. And uh, I think that that's such a pivotal um, age where, you know, uh, young people are so, you know, like receptors, you know, 13 years old, uh, you know, you, you really take things in at 13, you know? Well, back then, what did we have? You know, we had our imagination. <laughs> we had, yeah. we either played sports during the yeah. day. Uh, we hung out with our friends. We had movies, we had music. And of course we went to school as well. But for the most part, it was the things that really, interested us in in like in like you said movies like you you got into movies because of your dad yeah film um i wish i had that because that would be i always said man i'd love to do special effects and stuff like that but um if music calls first then that's the way i gotta go yeah yeah um film was a, a a big part of my life growing up it was something that uh, we, I went to the movies a lot as a kid. I went with my dad a lot and it was just, and, and my friends I grew up with, I mean, we, I, and I don't, I don't think like it, it's unique to you or me. It, it's that, you know, we, we'd go, you know, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Blazing, <laughs> Sad, Blazing Saddles, you know, these are films that we saw as kids, you know, over and, and over and over again, you, you go to the James Bond, you know, you go to the James Bond movie and, and, you know, that was a big, and, 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 you know, I grew up uh, as, as a young person in the city, you know, you go to 86th street or 42nd street and the theaters, the, the, it was, it was like an event, you know, it was, yeah, it was, it, yeah. It was an interactive event. <laughs> well, well um, I, the first time I saw Jaws was at the 80, 86th street playhouse. Oh um, yeah. There you go. Uh, and we waited online line to see it and had that whole experience. And my favorite part of, of the movies back then is when you would see the lobby cards walking in and it would tell you a little bit about the movie. Um, and I, the the greatest thing about Jaws to me is like you never saw the shark until later on. Yeah, it was always it was always in here. Like whoa, whoa, what is this? They just kept it hidden. Later on, we found out why it was hidden. But right, um, it it was so clever and like that's the one thing about Spielberg, the way he tells the story. Like nobody does it better than him. You know him and Scorsese and those directors. Man, there's I, I know there's great directors out there now. But for some reason, I just don't gravitate to them the way I, I once did with the older directors, you know? Yeah, there's there's a lot. I, I watched I, I watched the film again the other night, and, and I learned a couple of things, uh, which was incredible. But um, let's talk about how the film came to be a, a little bit. And uh, apparently, you know, the, the, the two... The, the two that set this into motion was the two producers, Zanuck and Brown. And of course, you know, uh, Richard Zanuck, going back to the, 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 the um, Planet of the Apes series, he was involved with Planet of the Apes and he was, I think he was married to uh, Nova from Planet of the Apes, um, Linda, Linda, Linda Harrison. But um, so Richard Zanuck and, 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 um, and Brown, uh, they read uh, Peter Benchley's novel. Um, I guess uh, Brown's wife, uh, Helen Gertie Brown. Helen Gertie like, Brown, right. Right. She was the editor of Cosmopolitan. 
And right. he was he was leafing through Cosmopolitan, and there was a in, in the literal in the lit, literary section there was a review of Benchley's book, and it said at the end it said would make a good movie. Yeah. So so he got his hands on it, and um, they both read it in a single night, and they both agreed the next morning it was the it was the most exciting thing that they ever read, and they purchased the film rights in 1973. For one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, which is basically like a million dollars in in today's money, but in today's yeah, currency. yeah, that that that's what's that's what set it set it into motion it, it, is th those two guys, you know. But uh, but Spielberg wasn't attached to it. They no, actually, they actually no. put another director on it, and um, they had a meeting with this new director, and the, the director yep. was telling them what he wants to do, and then he said the he said the line. When the whale comes out, and then they said, "Whale? No, no, no! It's not a whale. It's a shark." Right. And then from that that moment, they said he wasn't the guy for it. And yeah, it's funny was... because could you imagine that? Like the whale comes out, it's like, <laughs> it, yeah, that was uh, Dick Dick Richards. Um, uh, first, they wanted John Sturgis, who was an old school Hollywood yeah. director. He did Old Man in the Sea with Spencer Tracy. And then, and then they they got hooked into Dick Richards, who directed this film called The Culpepper Cattle Company. But he kept referring to the shark as a whale. A whale, yeah. And that, and, and that was it. And I guess twenty six year old Spielberg uh, saw it because he he directed a film for for Zanuck and Brown before that called The Sugarland Express. Right, with Goldie Hawn. That's right. But he also did a, a a TV movie called Duel. That's right. Which he always says was his Jaws on land because right. it was the big tractor, the big trailer, um, yep. uh, chasing this this man. Which was I remember seeing that movie too. When I was yeah, what was his name? Too. That was um, Dennis. Dennis. Hopper? Dennis. No. Hopper. Den no. 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 It wasn't Dennis. Uh, Dennis. No. Um, he played uh, McLeod. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis. Dennis. Weaver. Dennis. Weaver. Dennis Weaver. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> God, yeah. I don't know how I pulled that out. That was good. Yeah. Den Dennis uh, Dennis Weaver. Yeah. And that, that was like, you know, very uh it was almost like the prelude to, to Jaws. And and he felt um he felt there were similarities between the film that he just did, Duel, and you know, and Jaws. And uh, you know, they, they gave him a crack at when you think about it, he was 26 years old. Jesus. You know? 26 years old, and he had that kind of that wisdom or that uh, he went into that movie thinking, okay, I think I could do this. And then he had a meltdown a few times during the movie. And he, uh, he says it was a nervous breakdown because he was in over his head. Yeah. Uh, the movie didn't wrap uh, the way it was supposed to wrap. It went way over budget yeah. and he thought this was it. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, as far as um, the, uh, the casting of this film goes, um, they didn't want big name actors, right? Because they felt like big name guys, you know, were going to take away. They wanted it to feel like this could happen to anybody or, or, or any man. And uh, I guess Robert Duvall um, was was offered Brody, and right. he, he he wanted to play Quint, and and <laughs> and, then, and then Charlton Heston was was in the mix, but they knew. They couldn't bring Charlton Heston to it. He he like commands the screen, you know. Yeah, how could you put Moses in, in yeah. that movie? But the one yeah. the one actor that I thought could have worked was Lee Marvin. I guess they yeah. wanted him right. for for Quint, right? Which, um, but I guess he had some issues, uh, with tax issues or something, and he he was out of the country hmm. or something. I don't remember that that Lee, whole story, Lee Marvin but... Lee Marvin could have worked. He definitely could have worked. And then they had an actor before Richard Dreyfus, who was in the movie The Summer of 42. I think his name was Timothy Bottoms. Yeah, he of was course. yeah. Timothy he Bottoms. he was yeah, he yeah. was gonna be the Hooper uh that, part. Yeah, and 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 <clears throat> Dreyfus, you know, Dreyfus wasn't interested in it until um he did the the apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz. <laughs> And he he so felt it was a bomb, and he'd never get any other work. So he circled back, and and he and he took the role. You know? Could you imagine? Yeah. What? Which kind of man? That 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 movie kind of. I don't know how he perceives Duddy Kravitz because that was kind of a flop. But if he didn't take this Jaws role, 
uh, he may have been forgotten. You know? Well, the, the, it was, it was uh, I guess, George Lucas uh, directed him in American Graffiti. Graffiti, yeah. and, and he came highly you know, recommended from George Lucas, who directed him in American Graffiti, which is a great film. And, uh, you know, he, he, yeah, he took it. Interesting, I, I guess, uh, Dreyfus was 29 when he did that role. Spielberg, was he 29? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And 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 uh, you know we're we're uh, we're skipping we're we're going where the horse leads us here. But this, tell us what's going on here in this shot. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> all right. There's a story behind the, the yeah. Barrel let's hear. Across. Let's hear this. Let's hear the barrel story. Okay. So. Um, I always wanted to get one of these barrels, you know, and there's been fake ones out there. So uh, a few years back, um, I was um, approached by Matt Taylor and Matt Taylor, he did this book, uh, Memories from Martha's Vineyard. Um, but Matt was interested in doing a book uh, for Metallica, um, which uh, later came out to be called uh, Back to the Front. But he didn't have a contact from Metallica, so he he approached me because I knew a mutual friend of his, and he knew a, a friend of mine. So we started talking. So I put him in touch with the Metallica guys and got that book moving. And he was so grateful for for that that he put me in touch with Susan Murphy. Now Susan Murphy was the wife of Lynn Murphy. Lynn Murphy was the Wrangler on Jaws. Wow. Who took care took care of all the props, the boats, sure. everything, the barrels. He said, I know you wanted a barrel. I'm going to, I'm going to do this for you. So he put me in touch with Susan Murphy and she got me a barrel and that's how that happened. <laughs> and and then, then, yeah. So this, okay. So, um, I do these horror conventions and my friend, Bill, Phil put, put this one on, this was a days of the dead. Uh, and Richard Dreyfus was appearing and Bill said, bring the barrel. Richard wants to see it. And he, he said, he'll sign it for you. So I'm like, really? That's awesome. Brought wow. the barrel. Richard scribbled on it. And we, <laughs> we, had, we had a great conversation about Jaws and about the goodbye girl. And, um, and uh, that was it. So I was kind of in Jaws heaven talking to Hooper. You know? that, that's, that's incredible. Here, here's, an, here's another shot from that day. That, that's, that's awesome. You know, you know he, he won an Oscar for uh, Goodbye Girl. Yes, I know. Yeah, which he did like two years after Jaws. His, his, his career went bing, bang, boom, like early on. He really took off, man. I mean, Richard Dreyfuss was the, the 70s kind of guy that just everybody liked, you know, in movies yeah. when, you, when you saw him. Um, so for me to talk to him and just get his side of things and the stories that he was, you know, telling, and uh, was it true that there was a thing on set between him and, and uh, Robert Shaw? Uh, Robert Shaw basically was a method actor and he kept it up even when they weren't shooting. Put him, put Richard Dreyfuss to hell, basically. Yeah. Yeah, Robert Shaw... Robert Shaw was uh, a little rough around the edges, man, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he looked it. You know, he, he he drank a lot, which probably had a lot to do with it. You know, I watched it the other day, and I said to my gal, could you believe Robert Shaw is 52 years old in this film? Dude. <laughs> he looks – dude, that's, that's a bunch of years younger than us, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you but – uh but what, I mean, Robert Shaw before that, he was in a Bond movie, of course. He he was in The Sting. The Sting, which well, that that's what like that's what got him involved in this. Yeah, The Sting. Now The yeah. Sting was a huge blockbuster too. It could have been one of the first real blockbusters, you know, of the summer. Talk um, about kids. Talk about movies when we were a kid, man. The Sting was huge. Whew. You Love know, that um, movie. and then the blockbuster after The Sting, I would say, would have to be The Exorcist. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I always talk about The Exorcist with, with, with like, my friends. Uh, and I said that the reason why The Exorcist was so powerful back then is because of religion back then. Mm. You know, Catholicism in the country, you know, everybody was Catholic. <laughs> and, like, nobody touched this, this, this story, you know. Yeah. So when The Exorcist hit, it shocked so many people. And it was, it was fucking scary, too. 
You know? It was a horrifying film, especially for a young person, man. It, it was it was a scare. It was a scary film, man. That that movie cannot be made nowadays. You know that because some of the things that they had Linda Blair do, you cannot get away with that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's take a look at this clip, and uh, this is a person supposedly that really uh, the the Quint the the Robert Shaw Quint character was. Uh, based on or was he veteran shark killer captain frank mundus and his friend don braddock have done it again this time reeling in what is being called a world record at around midnight the two long island fishermen brought in a great white shark weighing more than three thousand pounds news 55's matt sesney has the story after nearly two days at sea, Montauk shark fishing king Frank Mundus returned early this morning with a world record catch, a 17-foot, 3,500-pound great white shark. It's believed to be the largest great white ever caught with a rod and reel, literally shattering a 27-year record set in Australia by almost 1,000 pounds. Veteran Montauk fisherman Don Braddock brought the shark in with Mundus in about two hours. Both, though, had staked out the shark for two days. I Yo, let me just say here, it's a little fucked up. Back then, you could get away with, you. we killed the thing. You know? Yeah, dude, the, the man-eater. Like, uh, people loved this back then, you know, because uh, it, it, it was something that... I, I, do you remember every magazine that was around at that time? It was like kill a shark, yeah. you know. And, and when and I bought them all, but the stories <laughs> about sharks killing people were just so sensational. You know, it was like, yeah. oh my god, another shark attack! And I remember uh, wanting to go to Montauk to get a glimpse of a great white shark, as if I would go to Montauk and they'd be all over, you know, swimming. Um, yeah. So I remember this story, and I remember it was in the it was in the paper too. Sure. Dare I say I'll never even see one this large again, but uh, I'm happy with. You're sitting on top of the world. How does yeah. that feel? It's good. It's good. I like it. I needed. I needed this. It took us 40 years to do it. The top of the ladder. And no, no higher. You can't go any higher. Just as amazed as Mundus and the other fishermen, though, were the onlookers who had to see the jaws-like creature to believe it. It's amazing. <laughs> Simply amazing. I'm not a fisherman either. <laughs> well, will you become a fisherman now? Never. <laughs> you saw one behind my boat once with a head as big as my boat. My boat is seven foot wide. He had his... Um, seriously. Uh-huh. We took off like hell. My son says, let's catch him. I says, let's get the hell out of here. Now, according to Captain Mundus, this great white was spotted some 30 miles south of Montauk two days before it was landed, feeding off a dead whale. Now, the amazing part is, according to Mundus, this was not the only shark out there at the time. According to him, they more or less had their choice of some six to eight great whites. That whale was only dead for 24 hours before we found him. So, I mean, when you really think about it, it's amazing. That, that we do have that many white sharks in this area. In Montauk, Matt Sesney News, 55. Man, dude. you know, and, he, and, and you know, Frank Mundus <laughs> sounded drunk as a skunk. He oh sounded a hammer, I know. Dude, he's been drinking uh, since 7 a.m. Oh, man. Now, the, you know, the thing about Frank Mundus and Quint, you know, um, I guess, it, it, you know, uh, Peter Benchley says he, he went out on Mundus's charter and, you know, he was basically, he was, he was quit, right? There was another guy too that they, um, he was in the movie. He played Ben Gardner. That I got uh, it. Also I got it. Yep. yep. You know, I there's a theory, it. there's a theory out there that when Ben Gardner was killed, it wasn't the shark that killed Ben Gardner. It was Quint who killed Ben Gardner because he was a rival fisherman and he didn't want him to get the money for killing the shark. Um, that's that's deep, bro. I never heard that one. That's deep. So I mean, if you think about if you think about it, you know, how could a shark gouge out his eye? You right. Know? But then Hooper did find the tooth. So, Here, I, ben, know, there, there's there's Ben Gardner. That, that now yeah. this is this is one of the things that upon watching the movie the other night, 
in my notes, I never connected that Ben Gardner was in the film before, you know, uh, Ben Gardner's, the, the Ben Gardner's head scene, which for those that may need a reminder, here you go. You know, that, that, that bit, I never realized, um, until I watched it the other day. Cause when you, when, you, when you watch it on whatever it is, Amazon, when you pause it, it tells you who the actors are in the scene you know who they're playing. And when Hooper shows up in the boat and gets out of the boat and he goes, hello. And, and, and Ben Gardner goes back to him. Hello to you, young fella. Yeah, like that's... I never realized, I, I always thought that, Oh, that's Ben Gardner's boat. Like, just you know, he sort of recognized the boat. I had no idea that Ben Gardner actually is that character that shows up in the film earlier. Yeah, and he was—he's uh, from the island, and he was right. just someone who was, I guess, helping out. But uh, Spielberg liked him so much that he put him in the movie, and um, and I can't remember his real name, uh, but. He's in the documentary too, and his daughter tells stories about him. But I think a lot of the Quint stuff came from him in real life. Um, but yeah, if you look at that, you know, his eyes kind of gouged out. And how, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, man. I, I don't know. So yeah. maybe, maybe it was Quint who who actually killed him. Yeah, it 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 kind it, it kind of makes sense. And here he is. Uh, Robert Shaw, Robert Shaw has always been one of my favorite actors. I mean, uh, he, he's, he, he was, he was one of my favorites in, in everything, everything that he, he did. He did so much. So, well, you know what? He was in a film and I remember another film from when we were, when we were, uh, kids, uh, I think it was called black Sunday. Um, yeah, it was like football. a terrorist, terrorist film, yeah. football stadium. He, yep. yeah. Yep. I, and I of course, and too. of course the taking of Pelham one, two, three, right? That's right. He was in that too. Uh, he always played a villain, in, yeah. in a sense. But I never, you know, after after you know watching Jaws for all these years, you, you you've come to to like Quint. And uh, yeah, there's a deleted scene that they don't they didn't put in the movie, and it's a scene where the first appearance of Quint, and he gets out of his truck, and he goes into the music store, and he buys piano wire, and there's a little boy practicing his sax, uh, his clarinet. And Quint is just on this kid. Like, this is how it should go. And he's like, ba, 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 ba. Finally, the kid just stops playing. It's it's a great scene. I don't know why. I've never it seen that. Movie. It's a really good that. scene. Yeah. And he's getting piano wire. Um, G- Gary says, Gary Alford says, his son Ian is uncannily like him. Did you see? Yeah. yeah. I saw that. It's amazing guess, how Yeah, I guess how he's he doing a play like or him. something, right? Yeah, I think it's in in uh, in London. I think that's where they're doing it. The Daily Jaws guys, who uh, <laughs> I, I've I've known uh, those guys for a while now, I, I, just on Instagram and everything, and uh, uh-huh. they're they're huge Jaws uh, fanatics like I am, and we uh, talk every once in a while. And I, I, I think they've seen the the play, and I, I'd love to see it. It'd be great. Yeah, obviously, Jason. Yes, does Charlie follow the Daily Jaws from the UK? Of yeah. course. There, there you go. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, this, um, which is, hold on, let me find this. The location that they shot the film in, and here you are. Tell us a little bit about what's happening here. Uh, let me see the, I can't see the photo yet. It's coming it's- up. It'll come up. The magic of um, there you go. Oh, so though okay, so this was like in 1993 or 94. Um, and okay, so Radio City, uh, we're gonna do a special screening of Jaws back in 93 or 94, I forget when it was. And Peter Benchley was gonna uh be there too, and he was gonna come out and and speak before the movie and just you know talk about the writing of Jaws, the making of Jaws. So I said, okay, I'm gonna plan a trip around this. That's it, that's Radio City. Um, And I went to Martha's Vineyard. Uh, I spent a couple of days there and uh, did that big, you know, the ferry that takes you from uh, Rhode Island. uh, The one one you see see in the film, right? That's the one. 
That's the one, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. I, I stayed in Edgarstown and I went to every location that I could find because nobody knew anything when I got there. The only thing that, huh. the only person that I met from the movie Jaws, there was a restaurant and the actor who played uh, Alex Kittner was the manager there. Is that and, right? Yeah, and they had a Kittner burger on the menu and it was like a full. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and it was like a fillet of fish. So I had to scout each place and just find it on my own. So I I went there. That's the estuary. That's where the, the pond. Shark? Um, Shark? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, it was awesome. And then when you walk around the town, dude, nothing was changed. It was all the same. <clears throat> and uh, I was just in, in, in heaven because basically – it, being there kind of put me in the movie you know i was transporting to the to amity island it was, it was it was so silly and so goofy but hey <clears throat> i got a kick out of it what, what is this this location here is this where um where uh where she washes up that first scene yeah of the yeah, so, yeah so that's where they told me it was like around there but you can't there's no fence the little fences that they had that that's not yeah. there <clears throat> but um that was that part i right got there. it i i I, um, I picked it up yeah i think it's called gayhead cliffs i think that's huh. where it was and there's the tower there too um but i don't i don't know i mean all the stores were basically the same um and there was a, a on the corner. There's the store of Black Dog. I think it was called. That was oh, that that's there. I remember that the Black Dog cap the back restaurant. Yep. The, oh yeah, that yeah, that's that, that, there. That. Um, a lot of the restaurants yep. are there, and that's basically that's where the, that's the shot where he pulls he he drives down the street and yeah, exactly. And he gets the supplies and he tells sure. Hendrix, you know, yep. beach is closed and let Polly do the printing and all that stuff. <laughs> right, um, right. So <laughs> now they'll have right Polly. There. They'll have Polly do it. Right. Let Polly do the printing. What's wrong with my print? So, have Polly um, do it. Yeah. So yeah, I, and that was it. I spent a couple of days there. Went to a bunch of bars, and it was it was fun. It was silly, but it was fun. Yeah, that that's that that's uh, that's awesome. Let's um let's talk a little bit about um uh, some of the go go like actual some, some scenes in the film and stuff like that and you know the, the first thing that you hear in this film like these are off these are off my notes movie comes up from black the first thing you hear is the music and it really sets the table man it, it was like i mean it's still black the you know it's it's not even up from black you hear that 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 john williams you know film score i mean that any 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 can you give us any perspective on 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 that music i think the 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 music i don't think the movie would have been as successful without that john music uh john williams music yeah. um he sets the tone for that movie and the movie actually scares you even going into water when you hear the music it kind of does a little something to your to your to your brain um so i would say that the john williams music is just two notes yeah, but it totally sets the mood for that movie. And yeah. it's funny whenever you hear that music in the movie, you know the shark is there. And when you don't hear it, it is, there is no shark in the water. You know, yeah, which is yeah. very clever too. It, it, it's it's such, very Hitchcockian. Very, very, Hitch, very Hitchcockian. Yeah. And I know? think Spielberg was a huge fan of Hitchcock. Oh and, yeah. Um, but the one thing I'll say about John Williams is if you listen to uh, Stravinsky. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the rites of passage, uh, rites of spring. Um, sure. There's a part in that where I I think he got Jaws from that that piece. It's okay. very, very similar. Really? It's just bump, 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 but it's the same thing. And it's yeah. like, hmm, that sounds like Jaws. Hey, listen, like Zappa said, there are no original ideas, right? Yeah, no, there's only, only 12 notes. <laughs> there's only 12 notes, right. Uh, the music is the first thing you hear in the film. John Williams' film score earned him an Academy Award and was later ranked the sixth greatest score by the American Film Institute. Spielberg later said that without Williams' score, the film would have only been half as successful. And according to Williams, it jump-started his career. The main shark theme, a simple alternating pattern of two notes, 
uh, variously identified as E and F or F and F sharp, became a classic piece of suspense music synonymous with approaching danger. Williams described the theme as, quote, grinding away at you just as a shark would do. Instinctual, relentless, unstoppable. Exactly. It's I'm surprised. Great. I'm surprised that it's it is number six. Like, yeah. What's, yeah, that's, what, that's what Larry said. Only six. <laughs> what's what's ahead of it? Right. It, you know, it's like wow. I, I would say that that music is responsible for the fear. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And and I guess you know it. You know, after that, I mean, Spielberg went with John Williams. You know. Time and time oh, yeah. again after that. I mean, that's his go-to guy, right? I was, um, I've seen John Williams perform three times. Uh, he does a thing called the night at the movies. Oh, and, wow. um, and yeah, I saw, I saw it two times here in Chicago. I saw it once in New York and, um, he plays with the orchestra and they show you clips uh, of the movie, but he plays, they play everything live in front of you. So wow. when, when those songs come out, <laughs> and you're you're there experiencing it. It's like this is just amazing right now. Um, so when I watched him do, he did like two of the jaws. He, of course, he did the main theme, and then he did uh, one of the other ones, Off to Sea. You know when the boat oh yeah yeah leaves. oh love, I love that when 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 they when they pull out of the when they pull when they pull out of the harbor there. I love it, man. It's called yeah. I think it's called Off to Sea, and it's just yeah, such a sure. great great piece of music. Great um, scene. Great, 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 and uh, you know, of course, he's he's done. He, he did Star Wars, um, uh, uh, Ra e uh, Raiders e of the Lost e e e Raiders of the Lost star He did uh, what was the other one? Jurassic Park. It was just yeah, yeah. A, a night of just like this guy yeah. did all these songs. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, love that scene when 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 they they pull out of the the the, the, the harbor there. And the and the, and the camera goes through the through the the oh, through man. the jaws. Yeah, that's C come on, it's there's, great. There's some there's, I, there's some really great filmmaking in this film. Like if if, if like if you're a young person or or it, there's just some really great, just you know uh, so, like like um, meat and potatoes filmmaking in this thing. Yeah, I mean if you're if you're an up and coming filmmaker, this would have to be one of the movies that you watch. Uh, yeah. You know, to learn a lot about storytelling, movie making, and how uh, the other thing is editing. The way this movie is edited is just, it's great. I mean, and then Spielberg was just such a smart guy and he surrounded himself with smarter people, you know what I mean? And just experts. And yeah, this movie is just, this movie making 101. Well, you know, now that we touched on the editing thing, I, I'll take the ball and run with it. That was Vera Fields. Vera Fields. Um, Vera Fields, editor. She previously um, did Paper Moon and American Graffiti. She won Best Editing Oscar for Jaws. So she won an Oscar. John Williams oh, won man. an Oscar. Spielberg didn't even get nominated. No, which was completely like, how can you not nominate the director if the movie is getting Best Movie? Yeah. Well, th there's a clip. I saw a clip of him. There's actually a clip uh, of him. I see Frankie Carter just said that too. What's yeah. up, Frank? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I saw a clip on YouTube. They filmed Spielberg when 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 they made the uh, Academy Award nominations. Right. And he is like visible. He's like that. We're, we're like, he was pissed. Yeah. He was crushed. He was, he but, was crushed. You know, he got the, la he got the last laugh. Oh, yeah, for, for sure. Um, so she won a Best Editing Oscar. Her contributions to the six. Fields' contribu contr contributions to this success were widely acknowledged. She received an Academy Award and an American Cinema Editors Award for Best Editing. Within a year of the film's release, she had been appointed as Vice President for Feature Production at Universal Pictures. She was thus among the first women to ever enter upper-level management in the entertainment industry. Her career as an executive at Universal continued until her death in 1982 at 64. Jaws was the last film she edited. Crazy, dude. Isn't it? That's wild. That's, that's wild to, to, to think that. And then she went on from there to be like one of the one of the Universal's yeah. higher people. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. But I, I'm shocked that she she died. It's kind of that's kind of young. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And 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 you know, 
uh, you, you better believe that she greenlighted a lot of those Spielberg projects that we just talked about. <laughs> right. she, oh, oh, E.T., yeah, Raiders, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. No, dude, you know? It's funny, I, I watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. I watched the two, the first and the I haven't second. Se I haven't uh, seen those two in a long time. Uh, two weeks ago, and I was so excited again watching it because I hadn't seen it in a while, and it was just, again, just storytelling. Yeah. And... And you know Harrison Ford is just awesome in, in that movie. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, going back to back to my film notes, uh, this the, the the note on on this scene here, and and my my notes on this is, this was absolutely gruesome. This 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 opening scene when we watched it the other night, I was it, it's really really. A disturbingly gruesome scene, um, really yeah. disturbing. Yeah, and it's the first thing you see. It's the first thing you see. And uh, the, yeah, and the thing about it is, like, what if it? What if you would have seen the shark yeah. at this point? Um, would it have ruined the whole thing? Because the 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 element of the thing that scared me the most is like you didn't see it, yeah. and y your imagination was kind of like, what is going on? You know, um, but if you read the book, the book describes it as he's just taking pieces and pulling her and stuff, yeah. um, which is basically what's happening here. And the way they shot this, uh, uh, just reading about it and, and watching so many documentaries about Jaws is like they had her in a harness. And I guess they were pulling her from left to right, kind of, uh, it was kind of violent because Spielberg wanted it to look violent. And and man, she she's awesome in this in this scene, you know. Yeah, she's she's um, Spielberg was was forced um, due to the unreliable mechanical shark, sharks. They forced Spielberg to shoot many scenes so that the, so that the shark was only hinted at. Yeah, only hinted at. The, and, the opening the opening had the shark devouring Chrissy, but it was rewritten so that it would be shot with with her being dragged and yanked with the cables to simulate a, a, an, at an attack. Um, the forced restraint is widely thought to have added to the film's suspense. As Spielberg put it years later, quote, the film went from a Japanese Saturday matinee horror flick to more of a Hitchcock. The less you see, the more you get thriller. It's, it's, it's amazing because um, like in the book too, she feels something go by her. Uh, it's and, scary, man. And she reaches down and she doesn't feel her leg. Yeah. Like the bottom portion of her leg. But again, Susan Blackenity, that's the actress who played yeah. Chrissy. And she, and she does um, she does those chiller theater cons and stuff. Yeah, I've been, her. yeah. Yeah. But that scene, also that scene wasn't shot at night. It was shot in the day. And they did something to the film to make it look like it was shot in uh, in, in the dark. It's interesting. I have a note. I love how all the nighttime stuff looks. <laughs> yeah. I, I do. I love. I, I don't know. You know what film stock they used or what they did, but I love how the nighttime the nighttime stuff looks in this film. And and another one of my favorite scenes, which is shot at night, is when like the bounty hunters go out on the dock. You know, with, with the pot roast. Oh yeah, the, I love that scene, man. I love it too, and it's just like it's so, it's it's that Spielberg humor in that scene too. Yeah, that that really makes it work. Um, and it's like this is my wife's holiday roast, you know. <laughs> so if 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 I don't come back with something, right, I'm, I'm, I'm I may as well die out there with the shark, <laughs> you know. So that just those little things that he always puts in his movies, like to you know, kind of set you up for the next thing that's going to happen, you know? And and like we mentioned, the music, it's like when he's swimming back to the dock oh, and you hear yeah. the music and, and then, and then just, and you, you know, you see his feet slipping on the dock and they pull him up and the music sort of like fades down, like just. But that yeah. the one, the one scene in that, when, when they, when the dock breaks and it's just yeah. going out to sea and then it's like the shark discovers that there's someone there and then it spins around, you know, sure. and, then the, and then the music gets really intense. Yeah. And it's like, dude, that's a scary scene. 
Yeah, it's it's that, that's in my nose. It's one of my that's one of my favorite scenes, man. It's ah. and, and and it's interesting. I, I got to look at because I like one of my notes is I love how the nighttime stuff looks, and I guess yeah. they used I I you know I got to look that up. So what you know Kodak film stock they used and, and how they did it, and it's it's also in the opening scene when Chrissy runs out on the beach after the party. And like she goes out into the water, and it just it just it looks great. And I, th- yeah, they, because they, I would um, back in the day there was uh, the, the two books that I had when I was younger because mm-hmm. I, I was a fanatic on Jaws. There was the Jaws log, which sure, I remember was that. Carl Gottlieb did Carl that, Gottlieb, and then, right. and then uh, Edith Blake did one, um, and that was another book, uh, the making of Jaws. And there was scenes, and, and like I saw the Chrissy character like put this harness Harness. too on her and but it was it was at daylight I'm like how to right this wasn't shot at in the day it was shot at night but then when you watch the documentary they talk about this filter that was put on the film to make it look like it was night sure now here's a shot of you and 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 the great Carl Gottlieb tell us a little bit about about what his role is was uh, in this film well I didn't even think he thought he was going to be in the movie as the 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 reporter or the journalist in the movie, I forget what uh, how Spielberg put him in, but he kind of wrote a part of the screenplay. Right, and th- those are the stories that Spielberg talks about. They would meet in a cabin and do rewrites and stuff like that. The ni- and mostly the night before they were shooting, right? Mostly the night before they were shooting. So yeah, that was cool to meet uh, Carl Gottlieb. Uh, he's just a big part of that Jaws world too, you know. And also, there's the. Um, I'm looking for my. There's also uh, John Mil- Mil- Milnes, Mil- Milius, John Milius, John yeah. Milius. He he did some. It was interesting um, doing my homework. A lot of people had had their pen on this on this script rewrite. There was like six or seven people that sort of a little bit of this person, a little bit of that person. You know, there's a lot going on. But didn't uh, wasn't uh, John Milius the one who did the. Um... The scene with the uh, the Indianapolis, the Indianapolis, yeah, correct. Uh, uh, he he wrote that, and wasn't wasn't Robert Shaw drunk when he did that scene? Yes, he was uh, apparently, and but they but I I did see that Robert Shaw had a big rewrote rewrote it as well. I mean that that's that's his star turn in this film is that Indianapolis oh, yeah. scene, man. I mean it is it is. And, and and if you and, and if you're a bit of a history buff, which I am, a World War II history buff, that that scene is is really really. Um, it's heavy. intense. It's yeah. intense. And the thing that I love about that scene is is like he's looking at Brody as he's telling him about it, and then Hooper's sitting back. Like Hooper's the, just like, "Wow, you were on the Indianapolis," you know. And I love and how then, it just goes quiet. Because when you said earlier about he was 52 um and then i guess that makes more sense you know because hooper is young he's a young kid you know so i guess when he heard that quint was on the indianapolis i think that's when he got a lot more respect for him you know because before that he just couldn't stand them (laughs) yeah yeah and 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 that's uh, that's all true the Indianapolis is 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 another horrifying story that they were delivering the atomic bomb to Tinian, and it was it was such a um, top secret mission that when they were torpedoed and sank, n- nobody knew that they that that they were there. Right, the Hiroshima bomb. Oh God, the unbelievable. So yeah, but that's a that's a great um, that's a great scene. Yeah, it, it in, is in that movie. Yep. And, and yes, uh, John M- M- Milius uh, was behind the whole Conan thing. He, he, he wrote the show and I think he directed the first Conan film as well. You know, so so that said, hey, let me do a, a sponsor, um, a little sponsor break here for a couple minutes and, and announce a couple uh, upcoming shows. Hmm? Jaws cereal. Get it at your local. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is that way? Let me see that. Let me see that. <laughs> I got this at a convention. Uh, wow. about a month ago, and it's real. <laughs> I like I it like, says feed. It says feeding time on it. <laughs> I know. I love it. That is awesome. But, <laughs> but it's, it, it's multigrain. Just so you know, guys, it's multigrain. Right. 
<laughs> you know, back in the day, it, it would be sugar. It would be like frosted flakes. <laughs> yeah. But now it's multi-grain. It's multi-grain. <laughs> oh, shit. All right, man. I'll see you in a minute. All right, man. All right, there you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, often imitated, never duplicated. Our guest today is Mr. Charlie Benante from Anthrax and huge Jaws enthusiast. And we are having a real good time in our first show from 2022. We are sponsored by Blah, 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 and Blah, and the Texas Silver Rush. It's a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers Greg Rolay, Ringo Starr, and, of course, Agnostic Front. During this current, never-ending, apocalyptic pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages and, of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Come on now, Vlad, the organic grill. It's a vegan restaurant located in the East Village of New York City at 123 First Avenue. Featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and Veg News, the dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Goddamn Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu can be made gluten-free for all you gluten-free motherfuckers. This year, they're celebrating their 21st anniversary, and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing clean food. They have now fully reopened for business and look forward to seeing you. Get in touch with them, order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com. How about the next, next four shows? Here we go. Let me clear this stuff. The next, next four shows coming up on Wednesday, February 2nd. The Weiss guy himself, Mr. Mark Weiss, photographer, will be on the show, uh, has a book out called The Decade That Rocked. Legendary guy, iconic stuff. And it just so happens a week later, Ed Culver, photographer, will be on the show. Of course, you know him. Shot the Black Flag Damage record cover, Bad Religion, Circle Jerks, TSOL. That's going to be a great one. Sunday, February 13th, Doro Pesh will be on the show. Come on now. And then one week after that from Madball, and formerly Strength in Numbers, set it off. Mr. Mike Gernari will be on the show. So lots of good stuff coming up. Don't be scared. Fake my hand. Uh, what else do I need to mention? Oh, yeah. Hey, how about that? I got a Patreon page. You might be wondering, hey, I love the show and I want to support it. Well, there you go. www.patreon.com slash Drew Stone. Come on now. Uh, all patrons. The book is free. The New York Hardcore Chronicles, Volume 1, 1980 to 1989. All you patrons, if you're watching the show and you haven't got the book yet, all you got to do is pay the shipping. Reach out to me. Let's get you the book before this thing sells out. Um, I want to shout out a couple of my latest patrons. Uh, Marla Standing Owl, Durand Hayes, and Miriam Ohm. Thank you for your support. And also thank you to all the Facebook pages that, uh, that let me post about the show on there. And, uh, and support the show. I really appreciate it. Um, what else? What else? What else? Yeah, I'll ship the next day, you bum. Order the book, you bum. Yeah. If, if, if you're not up for Patreon, here's the book address again. That's www.stonefilmsnyc.com. All right? Be there. Don't be hilarious. Uh, also, if you're watching the show in rerun, there is a subscribe button right there. Tickle, tickle, tickle. Subscribe to the show. You get alerts. Also, if you have a communication device, you can find me on Instagram at Stone Films NYC. Get with the program, will you? Don't make me come looking for you. Um, what's the theme song at the top of the show, Drew? Please and thanks. That is Antidote NYHC Divided State. Uh, it's on the new release that we just put out called Scarred. Uh, it's going up on um, on all the uh, streaming platforms. Uh, it's sold out uh, on vinyl, but it's going up digitally very soon. That is Antidote NYHC Divided State. That is the opening um, music show. Uh, uh, asking about Sid the Kid. Sid's, Sid's coming on in a minute. 
and he'll he'll let us know if did Sid make it home after being quarantined in London for what was it a week or so? Um, okay, what else? This this show's sick. Good, I'll take that. Is that's a good thing, right? It's sick, sick as in funny. You mean how you mean funny? Like funny good? <laughs> sick as in like unhealthy, or sick as in good? <laughs> yep, there you go. Or no, sick. Sid's not drunk in Europe anymore. Um, let's bring. Uh, let's clear the deck. Let's bring our guests back on. Hold on. Let me clear this stuff off. All right. Let's bring Charlie Benante back on. Hey, man. Hey, bro. Let's bring Sid the Kid on. Hey, Sid. What's up, Drew? What's going Are on? Are you still Charlie? in London, or, or did you, or did they <laughs> let you come home? I don't know. Last time I checked, this doesn't look like London to me. I mean, it could be, but how long did you sit rotting in that hotel room in London? Oh, about eleven days. Jeez, man. Oh, and what you had to. Sh- no, no, go ahead, Drew. You had to show negative before you got back on the plane. You got to show negative if you leave the country. Period. You know what happened, yeah. Charlie? Sid, Sid was over there. He went to a bunch of shows. He saw the ex Florida, the UK subs, and he did his he did his punk rock. He did his football thing, and you know, blah blah. And then and the day before he was supposed to go home, you got you got to show a negative, right? He he went he went and got tested. and He came up positive. Oh man. Three three positive tests in five days, dude. Oh my god! Not so did fun. You, did you have to do like a PCR test or just rapid? Oh, I did. I did PCR rapid, whatever I could, just to try to get to get the fuck out. Funny uh, thing, really dude, quickly about this was, I'm having people left and right, dude. You know, you could go to Mexico. You could. I'm like, dude, they're not gonna let me out of the country. Doesn't matter where the fuck I go. Like, yeah. you show you show positive, your ass is stuck. Pretty much. Dude, speak, speaking of which, Charlie, I'm going to Scott Koenig's funeral tomorrow. Oh, uh, dude, that's. I know you were friends with him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was, you know, we were doing a show in Sacramento. We were doing that Louder Than Life show. Uh-huh. And uh, I was in LA two days prior to that. And I was with Dominic. Yeah. And Dom's like, Scott's not doing well again. And I'm like, well, he's in the hospital, but no one can go see him. Yeah, because because of COVID, and then uh, Dom said, "Well, he was doing he the next day he was doing better, and then he went downhill." I'm like, "How did that happen?" I talked uh, to him. I talked to him 24 hours before he passed, and I said to him, "I was talking to him. I said, you know, how you doing?" And he said, "I'm dying," and like you know, people say that all the time, right? Like, I'm fucking, I'm dying. He that's literally one of the last things he said to me. Like, I'm not, you know, he said, "I'm I'm dying." And 24 hours later, he passed. And yeah, they're out in Staten Island. We'll be out at the graveyard in the morning in Staten Island. Very sad. Very, Very sad. sad. Yeah. I've known Scott since 1983. I know, man. He he loved you guys. And, uh, you know, Dominic, I know you guys go way back with Dominic DeLuca. And, and you know, Scott does. Yeah. And, you know, all you guys, man. You know, all you guys. You know, it's like we brought Dom on tour with us in 1988 into Europe. <laughs> and... You know, Dom's like a brother. Yeah. Yeah, he's just a great dude. You guys, you guys put him on. I mean, he knows, you know, he, you know, you guys put him on. Biohazard put me on back in the day. You know, it's like you, you know, Dominic was out there and 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 got rolling and and he's doing okay for himself. He's got the store on Melrose, you know. Dude, yeah, Mike Pooch is with him. And that's you know, right. It's, that's right. And Dom's just determined and Dom is building, he built a name for himself and uh yep. Dom's Dom's a good dude. Good. All right, let's move. Let's move forward here, Sid. Let's do album of the uh, album of the week. And so here we go, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages. Here it is, Sid the Kid album of the week. Boom. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. Told you, Charlie. All right. Go go ahead, Sid. Well, guys, it wouldn't be fitting if I didn't have to talk about this record. You know, I had to go through a little bit of my sources here and there uh, and came up with this one. And, of course, this is Accept's fourth studio album entitled 
Restless and the Wild, or Restless and Wild. Uh, I believe um, they, this is recorded uh, from February to March and June of 1982, with it being released on October 2nd, 1982, at Derek Studios in Cologne, Germany. Uh, you know, I'm going to just do this as quick as I can, because obviously, you know, the first track alone is the theme of the show, Fast as a Shark. Now, for some people not really wondering what the hell I'm talking about, really, this can actually precede and this could be argued to hell and back that this this track alone precedes what is now known as thrash metal. When you listen to that double kick and it's just crunching guitar, you know, you know, there was well, there wasn't a term that technically wasn't a thrash metal at the time. But if there was, this would be that record. Just the first song in, in, within itself, you know, it was a almost a forty-four minute album. That I believe this is Dirk uh, Udo's first album, singing every every track with the band as well. You know, it's you know from front to back, it's a hard hitting record. I mean, I really can't say as much as I can with you know with Drew and Charlie, you know, putting in their two cents about it. So I well, had the uh, go ahead, I go was, go ahead, I, Charlie. I was an Accept fan before this album. Uh, the record before it was called Breaker. And it was so heavy, it was kind of like uh, the Scorpions uh, with more testosterone. Um, and, um, uh, dude, that album is so awesome. And then when this record came out, it was next level. It was like, holy shit, what the f- what is going on in Germany? Um, it just blew my head off. And, uh, a and, funny and, and, st- as, a dr- and, and as a drummer, as a drummer... Can- Killer, killer. Because yeah. like, <laughs> there was nothing like this song before. But drumming wise, it was it was so fast. And I'll give you a little insight too. When Scott and Danny Loker came over to my house to like kind of uh, give me my audition to be in the band, the first thing I said to them was like, "You're not going to ask me to play fast as a shark, are you?" And they were like, "Can you play it?" And I'm like, "Yeah." So we played fast as a shark, and that's this. <laughs> That's the song that kind of, I think, got me the gig. That's great. Yeah. And, and so is that is that right, Charlie? Before this, there, there was no real double bass players that sort of made their bones doing it? Well, there was you, Motorhead. You see, you, you see some of these guys from the 60s, like Ginger Baker with double bass drum sets or Mitch Mitchell. Like, what were they doing? Yeah, but they're... Once, once like the the metal guys, I think caught on to the two kick drums, and it became a part of the song. So you right. had like Judas Priest were doing it, uh, right. Motorhead were doing it. They had the song called Overkill, which sure. was fast, <laughs> fast, fast double yeah. kick. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But this, like I said, this was next level. They took it up a notch. The guitar right. riff was so heavy, and you're right, there was no such thing as thrash metal. Um, this, I think, was the catalyst. For bands like ourselves, Metallica, Slayer, I think to take it up the notch. So yeah, well done, Sid. Hey, I do what I can, Drew. I do what I can. Oh, we're glad to have you back in New York, buddy. Take care of yourself, and you know. And trust me, I ain't leaving New York anytime fucking soon. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, right. you know, you know what I always say: never get off the boat. No, I, 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 I don't get off. I learned, man. Me and Charlie were talking before. I learned. I moved to I moved to Vermont for a couple of years, married, raised a kid. I'm back. I'm never getting off the boat again. Well, I, I just love I just love hanging out on the gangplank, guys. That's all the fuck I do. I don't know why I keep doing it, but I keep doing it. All right, Sid. We're glad to have you back. Well done, young man. I'll talk to you soon. All right, Stay healthy. All right. That was cool, right? Yeah, that's cool. I mean, it's not cool that he probably had to fucking spend a ton of money staying in a hotel. Yeah, he did. He got he he got he got he got railed, man. Yeah, of course. That's you know. fucked up. But but know? but you know what? He's over there. He went to like six concerts in a row. He went drinking. He went out drinking with all the soccer hooligans. And then he he took a test the night before. He was, I mean, come on, bro. But you but know? did he get sick? Did he get sick, or did he just he was asymptomatic? He was, he, he was, he was, he was, he, hold on. He's, did you get sick? I thought I had bronchitis. Uh, it was not bronchitis. Just saying. Yeah. And to well, be that, fair, well, Drew, it was 13 shows in 14 days, screaming my head off. So I'm thinking, oh, it's probably, you know, 
No, no, no. It was it was a Rona. Okay. All right, Sid. Oh, that sucks. Hey, hey, Charlie, here's here's an interesting note uh, in the chat room from our friend Paris Mayhew, um, who, who, you know, you guys worked with and I worked with, you know, back in the day from Chromags. Me and Mackie got together a few times at West Beth Studio with the mission of figuring out how to make a song like Fast as a Shark. We didn't, but that's how the double bass in the chorus of We Gotta Know happened as kind of a consolation prize. That's awesome. <laughs> that's- that's great, hi, man. Hi, hi, Paris. I haven't seen Paris in years, dude. Well, I remember Paris. Paris shot. Um, I think he he was a camera operator on the live. Um, Bring the noise. I think live for you guys. Uh, Paris. Correctly. Yeah, and Paris and his brother Mick came. Uh, yeah, to Europe right. With us, and they did a a, a video for our, uh, Belly of the Beast. I think yeah, it was. Yeah, and um, right. Just sp- they spent like a week or two with us on tour. Right on. Cool. All right, let's pick it. Let's pick it. Uh, let's pick it back up. Um, let me see. You know, I, I'm looking at my notes again. Um, I gotta say, and I that Ellen Brody in the film, right? Now I remember watching. You know, watching the film through all the years. At first, she's like, she's older. She's someone's mom. You know, now <laughs> Ellen Brody's like fly, and I looked it up. She's like thirty-seven. She's thirty-seven years old in that film. You know? Wow. Yeah. And the she's thing about 37. Ellen Brody was, I always thought she was. They're from New York, right? They're supposed to be from New York. R- right. Um, right. She kind of looks like a New York kind of housewife too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I guess she was married. The actress That's Lorraine, right. Lorraine uh, she Garrett, was married Lorraine. to the uh, to the head of yeah. Universal, like a Sid Scheinman, and That's maybe right. that had something to do with her getting in the movie. But I thought she was perfect for this for this role. She 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 was great. Do you? I'm sh- I'm sure you've seen these before. I, I came across these found found a couple of them really interesting. These um, sort of alternate alternative like posters uh, for oh, the film. Oh, yeah, I have that. Uh, I mean, I, I was some of these are really, really great. And I, I've seen stuff like this, you know, when we go to Chiller or MonsterCon and stuff. You know, art, I, I think this is like a thing, right, where artists kind of do kind yeah, of their, grow- Yeah, their interpretation of, of uh, Jaws posters or, or scene, um, I, I just love it. Uh, it, there's so many amazing artists out there, and then how they how they interpret the movie and what they think the movie should be. Um, I like this one. I like this. this is probably my favorite. This one. Yeah, that's killer. I love it, man. It's a great. That's a frigging. I mean, you know, props to this artist for this is really you know unique and well done. I must say. You know? Yeah, that's just awesome. Everything yeah. about it, man. Yeah. Yep. And you know the funny thing is, I always, whenever I get talking about Jaws, um, like uh, I was with Greg Nicotero about a month ago. He was here. We did a a horror convention together, and Greg is a huge Jaws fan too. Is that right? Um, Greg, uh, basically, you know the story about the one of the sharks ended up at a junkyard. Absolutely know the story. I absolutely and, do. And I guess Greg got that and actually molded another thing, uh, another shark from I saw that. The, I saw the whole thing. He like, he, Dude. he like restored the thing over yes. years. So, 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 so if I remember correctly, what happened was the original Bruce sharks, right? One of them, one of them. Cause there was uh, three or four of them made and one right. ended up at a junkyard. If I remember, if I remember correctly, it, it, I, and I could be wrong. What what I read was that all the original sharks are gone. But what they did when the when the movie was a success was they still had the molds and made another one that stood at the entrance to Universal Studios. Yeah, that's I think the one that, that yeah. that's the one that ended up in the junkyard. It was the same thing, it, and and that's the one that they found and and he and he restored. So he, did, uh, Greg, is a huge Jaws fan like like i am so whenever we get together we, we talk about jaws but they did something for um the jaws fest and they made life-size uh molds or characters characterizations of the 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 three guys and um 
Nick Mara, oh. who's an, another one. He's a great special effects uh, artist. Um, he made my friend Jeremy Wagner. Is that a this? Life-size Quint. That's it. Yeah. Bingo. So Nick Mara made he made that for my friend Jeremy Jeremy Wagner and man the attention to detail. Look that at that! Hat, it looks like you're standing next to him. The hat is from the company that made the actual hat. The blackboard, which you can't see in there, but he has a blackboard that was from the actual company that made the blackboard that's in the school. Uh, Joe wow. Alves did the shark on the blackboard for him. I mean, it's so authentic, but it's not in that picture, but it's amazing. It's at Jeremy's house. Actually, Jeremy has my barrel too. I, I, I <laughs> It's at his house now. But yeah, that's it's so lifelike. Dude, this, this, is inc- this is this incredible. I mean, this is incredible, man. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. We all got to go to and, Jeremy's and wh- house. Where does this? Where is this? Where does this? Is this a? Uh, is this a, a an exposition? Exposition? Exposition that moves no. around? Like no, this is in Jeremy's house. <laughs> <laughs> here, here in Chicago, <laughs> Jeremy has a whole right on <laughs> a whole wing of the house uh, dedicated to like. Um, Jaws memorabilia and, and other memorabilia. You know, Jeremy has a huge can, Jeff Hanneman the beer can. collection. The beer can yeah. is perfect. That's great beer can, man. It like crushes too. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's it. Yeah, it, it's it's great. Rob, what a great Robert Shaw likeness. Um, Dude, it's I, eerie yeah. to, to, to just sit next to it. It's just, it's weird. He has the clogs on. He's got and the attention to detail that Nick Mara uh, did. It's just amazing. You know, um, two things that two things that I learned when I when I just watched the film the other night, take, taking notes. Um, the 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 the, the Kittner boy. I never realized <laughs> it was Kittner's mom who put up the three thousand dollar ransom um, for the shark. I I, I, I ne- that never registered to me that she's the one that put up the ransom. I never got that in, until I watched it um, the other night and. I came across this photo. It says it's a production photo from the film, but it's definitely not. Yes. Th- what is this? Do you know? So, okay, um, they shot the Kittner scene more, or it's, it's more graphic, actually. They actually shot the scene of the shark coming up and taking him down. But Spielberg felt it was just too gruesome, and it was early on in the movie that he felt it was just too intense and then just didn't do it. But when I saw this for the first time, I was just like, oh, my God, that exists. They actually shot it. But that's a dummy kid. That's not the real kid. Um, and I mean, shark, I mean that, that, that's pretty rad. <laughs> dude, that's, that's so awesome. That scared the hell out of me when I first saw that, too. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I never realized the mom put the bounty out of $3,000 for the shark. I, I, I never, uh, you, you know, that's why I like at this stage of the game, I really like watching films where they have the, where I could see the caption. Cause as, as a filmmaker, I like to see what the script writer wrote, you know? Right. And when I watch films, especially with my hearings, not great these days, um, I miss a lot. So I like, I like reading exactly because one one of the one of the things that I have utmost respect for is 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 screen original screenplays and screenwriters. I mean that that to me, you come up with an original, you know, you, you come up with an original screenplay like that's that's respect. That's that's the toughest. Oh, thing. absolutely. And I don't think I, I can't remember the last like real original type of screenplay yeah, or movie right. that 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 I sat and enjoyed and said, you know, that was really well done, well yeah. made. Um, but yeah, that um, I mean, the, the screenplay. I mean, is, is is so amazing. Like the, but the thing, the thing about Jaws too is the characters and the actors that actually got in the movie. I can't think of anyone better than who they got to play those roles. Yeah. And the thing that Spielberg did too is he got locals to play locals. Um, yeah, which right. added so much charm to the to to that island to that whole vibe of the movie. You know. So it's just clever movie making. Well, absolutely. And there's, you just reminded me of that scene when they sort of show, um, you know, uh, 
well, it, it, it's Martha's Vineyard, but w that, that scene with the music, w when the boat's pulling in and the people are coming out and it's sort of this whiz whimsical kind of vibe and it's like summertime and the, it was just done very well. Oh, know? totally, because it's like, it, it, it adds to that whole July 4th, 4th of yeah. July celebration, you know, and here's more people coming to the island that are potentially, you know, bait uh, yeah. for, the, for the shark. But the, the one scene, and I always talk about this one scene that got me, that scared me the most, is the one where they're in the pond. And the kids, the kids, the three of them are on the boat. And they can't get sure. the, the line. It's in a knot or something. And the guy, the fisherman the robo, is just in the robo. Robo. Sure. He's like, hey, you, you kids okay over there? And you see the shark. And that's the first time you see the shark in the movie. That's such, an, a, yeah. a, 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 that's such a great scene. Um, yeah. But you know they shot it. Uh, there was another scene that they shot where the shark is dragging the guy, and he grabs Brody's son, uh, and he's dragging. He pulls Brody's son, and Brody's son is being dragged by the shark too. And he's got wow. blood coming out. Not Brody's son, but the he, the guy's got blood coming out. Of oh his wow! Mouth. I they, didn't know that. They felt that that was another scene that was just too gruesome. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that scene, man, and it's funny. If you pay attention to that scene when the leg goes down, I, I know where you're getting at. I know what you're getting at. <laughs> the you're shoe? getting at you're, you're getting at that when he's rowing up, he's he's barefoot. He's barefoot, right? And when the when the leg goes down, he's got a shoe and a sock yeah, on it. Got, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like Spielberg talks about that, that they loaded up that leg to have a ton of blood gush out, but when oh, wow. it hit, when it hit, it was just too much blood that came out of his leg. <laughs> It's, it's yeah, so that, that scene. That scene was, yeah. When when you see when you see him trying to crawl back up on the boat and the sharks like, uh, oh man, it's heavy, dude. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a and and you know back back to the the Kittner's mom thing. Apparently, she slapped Roy Scheider. Set, they did seventeen takes, and then I, and 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 I read that, you know, she has people. You know, whenever she would do these comic cons or, or whatever. Right. Can, you, can you slap me? Slap me. Yeah. <laughs> Get smacked by her. But dude, yeah. she fucking she lays into him, man. Like she oh, yeah. hard. Yeah. You you know what but, scene I love you know what scene I love too? That it's just a great scene. Is is and, and, and when we watched it the other night, I, I I like laid it out for for my gal and like explained to her. Watch what's going on here. Is the the um the billboard help shark, you know, when 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 someone graffitis up the billboard and yeah. they have that interaction between the mayor and uh, Hooper and, and, Hooper Hooper and, and, and Brody Chief. and, and they have that interaction. And, and he says, you know, take a look at this, you know, these, these, you know, these, that's sick, pretty, sick, van, sick vandalism. <laughs> he says, He's like, your oh, specs are pretty much correct. Hooper says, yeah. These, yeah. These, these are pretty much right on, you know? And so, he's like, you'd love to prove that, get your name. Yeah. Into, National and Geographic. Then, and all. He just goes. Pew, but it is, it's so great that, that the character of Mayor Vaughn, who's played by Murray Hamilton, was also He's great. Yeah, he was in um, what's the Dustin Hoffman movie? A Graduate. Oh yeah, that's um, right. That's right. He's in that movie, but he's so great in Jaws, and there's a backstory to that character too. Because if you've ever noticed. He always has a cigarette, but he never lights it. Um, yeah. And I, I think he's trying to quit. <laughs> but um, he's always carrying a cigarette, but he never smokes it. But the best thing about Mayor Vaughn is that fucking blazer with the anchors on with it. With the anchors Dude. on it. It's mint. It's, it's, it's mint. so awesome. And, 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 I, and I pointed it out. I'm like, it, it's like foreshadowing. <laughs> It's totally. Uh, I see Mike Pooch. Yeah, Mike Pooch says, I want them hung up by their Buster Browns. Buster Browns. <laughs> um, and listen, you know, uh, Astoria Lou asks, and, and you know what? Why don't we, we could jump into it now. What does Charlie think of the sequel? And then, you, you know, I mean, we, 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 can, we, we, can, we can address that now. Let, let, let's delve into it. I mean, what, what, what do you make of the sequel uh, and the sequel after that and the sequel after that? I like okay, so out of all the sequels, I like Jaws 2 the best because it still has some of the characters from yeah. the first one. Sure. Uh it, it the thing that it didn't have, it didn't have Spielberg attached to it. Sure. 
And I didn't like the way the shark looked. It looked like a gray kind of turd. Um, yep. And then when they burnt the shark, it, it mm-hmm. ruined it. And I was just like, I don't know. Jaws 3D is is the worst ever. It's terrible. It's like, I saw it in the it, movies. It, I remember seeing too. it in the movies. It was it was incredibly crushingly disappointing. It was horrible. It's friggin' and horrible. And I'll never forget. And, and this is I still remember seeing it. And I saw it with my friend John Tempesta was there with me, and my nephew was there, and. We were just like looking at each other with the fucking glasses on. Like, what, what, like, what is this shit? It was horrible. Terrible. It was terrible. And I, I've never seen four. You know, where where Brody's Brody's wife is like here, and Michael Caine is in it. It's like what the. F- <laughs> it's in yeah. the Bahamas. Yeah, man. Uh, it's it's another one of those like, oh god, what is yeah. wrong here? I, anyway. I mean, it's it, it, you know. I remember being really disappointed by by the second second one as well, and it just it, sadly it's one of the, it just got worse just got worse each time, and it just goes to show what a what a what a masterpiece dictated by circumstance Spielberg directed. You know, he really it, it was it was really like we said it, it was really yeah three D was the worst sequel ever. They say four was like one of the worst movies ever made. You know. So. I would say watch four, and the thing about four that's good is that the shark looks looks okay, and there's a really cool scene in it where it's a really cool uh, death scene that the shark takes somebody and it, it it looks good, and then it's swimming underwater with that person and it's oh, uh, story loose is cool. Mario Van Peoples is in Jaws four yeah that's yeah, true, that's you, you know, good. um. I saw a film, I mean, going back, I, I thought, you know what I thought was a really, really um, smart, well-done film was, uh, what was the name of that film where they get, they, they jump into, they, they go scuba diving and they get left behind and then uh, um, Deep Water? Deep, Deep Water, I think it was. Yeah. Man, that film was scary. That was a, sh- that was a scary film, man. Was that the yeah. one that was kind of shot by them? Yeah, it was re- it was like a Blair Witch Project kind of thing, yeah. real low budget, but they really hit the note. It was terrifying. They got they were in the, they were scuba diving. They got left behind, and they're out there, and the whole film takes place. You know, yet yeah, Deep Blue? No, I don't think it was Deep Blue. No, Deep Blue. I think Deep Blue is another one. Sam, Samuel Jackson is in that. Yeah, movie, no, it's not Deep Blue. You know. I think it's called Deep Water or Dark Water. I think it was. I, I think. I yeah. think it was. I think it was Open Water. Open Water. Open Thank you, water. Frankie. Yeah. Thanks, Frankie. That 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 makes uh, that makes uh. Yeah, I remember sense. seeing that movie, and I remember seeing Deep Deep Blue or whatever it was called. The one Deep Blue was Jackson like a or... like a big monster shark, right? Yeah, it was like CGI, and yeah, yeah. It was like okay. Yeah. I think I think LL Cool J was in that movie too. Right, right. Oh, here we go. Or was it uh, open water? Yeah, open water. So l- let's let's go back to this a second, and and this scene at the end, which was, you know, this, <laughs> this yeah. Th- I mean, I mean, this was that that feeling you get as as the as the, <laughs> as, the, as as the orca is like every time it goes back to it, it's sinking more and more, and to the point where it's like. You know, the thing just jumps up and then, you know, there's this, there's this bit at the end when he, when he climbs up and this thing. That's intense, man. I love that scene. And he's stabbing it with the heart. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But you know what, uh, you know, it's a great scene too, is the, the end scene when both of them are swimming back to shore. With one of your um, barrels, with the bar- yeah, there's two with one of your barrels, think. and yeah. um, the John Williams music that plays uh, is just so perfect too. And that yep. that area, I believe that they swim back up, is called Gayhead Cliffs, and I think that's where the tower is over there. Um, but that I love that scene is um, because in the book, you know, Hooper dies. Yeah, somebody um, asked somebody asked about that um, in in the chat room before. I, I didn't get to it. Like, why does Hooper die in the book but doesn't die in the film? Right. I mean, is that something that was a decision that was made there? You know, um, 
Actually, if you yeah. if any if you read the book, Hooper has an affair with Brody's wife. That's too, right. That book. that's it. I was looking for. Yeah. Yep. There's a bunch of mafia stuff that's involved. Really? Uh, I get. I never read there. the book. Um, and um, it's I, 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 they couldn't put all this stuff in the movie. Um, but yeah, the the book is a really good book too. Um, but I, I I love what they did. You know how Here they it took is. the book. It, here it is. Uh, delivering, his, delivering his final script version to Spielberg, Benchley declared, I'm written out of this. It's the best I can do. One of his changes was to remove the novel's adulterous affair between Ellen Brody and Matt Hooper at the suggestion of Spielberg, who feared it would compromise the camaraderie between the men on the orca. During the film's production, Benchley agreed to return and play a small on-screen role as a reporter. Carl Gottlieb and John Milius did rewrites. The Indianapolis speech was written by, rewritten by Robert Shaw. That's hard to imagine that, that Hooper and Brody's wife had an affair? Yeah. Yeah. What? That's, in the, that's in the book. And I, I would always do that. I would always like uh, think of things like when Hooper shows up to the house with the two bottles of wine for dinner. Right. Is he like making eyes at Brody's wife? You know, yeah. <laughs> Brody's just off on some other shit at that point. Just well, like... well, you know, something we didn't talk about is Roy Scheider, who was who was cast as as Brody, and you know how they they ended up um, ended up with him, and apparently. They, they weren't really. Wait, I'm looking for. I had a I had a good note on this. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, Roy Scheider was considered, but Spielberg felt that he would play it too much like a tough guy, similar to his role in The French Connection. <laughs> yeah, but I guess I guess in the end, in the end, you know, he got it, and he's and he's great. I, I like that he's not like. I like the way he plays it, you know? Oh, totally. He plays it perfectly. Um, and he's that guy who is like, he lives on an island, but he's afraid of water. Yeah. You know, and it's like that one line, he said, it's only an island if you look at it from the water, you know? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. La Larry Kelly says, Spielberg didn't direct a shot of the shark exploding. He'd already returned no. to LA to begin post-production on the film after the film's shooting schedule. He left the shot to the second unit. You know anything about that? Yeah, because um, it became something that he would do. He would never shoot the last scene of his movies. That's right. That's it became right. a ritual. But he was it, afraid yep. that he was afraid that the crew like had it out for him because he kept them there right. for so long <laughs> that they were going to do something to him at the last with the last shot. But uh, but that became a thing with him. Like as if I know Spielberg. But uh, yeah, Stephen told me that it's a thing. You know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they loaded up the whole thing with like fish and other things and blew the shark up. And you know, when 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 the when the shark is blown up and it's sinking to the bottom, you hear sort of that raw. Yeah. And that is the same sound he used in his movie Duel. Right. When the when the truck goes off the cliff. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um this is this is a cool production shot and I, I like this a lot. Because you see on the right them filming it. And, um, you know, a couple of new uh, camera techniques were, were, were used by, um, by Bill Butler, who, who was the cin cinematographer. And they created this um, sort of um, casing that's, that enabled the camera to kind of go at the water level. They wanted, they wanted it to, you know, there's a lot of that water level. Like when that big panic where everyone's running off the beach – there's, there's all that. And they, they, they created some new innovative things to shoot this. Film. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I remember watching that whole thing about the filming of Jaws and how they created things because it was in the water and salt water had a, a, a terrible effect on the, the machines and stuff. And right. that that thing that they built, he, Spielberg wanted you to be like as if you were in the water, like eye level. And that's how that thing was created. Yeah. So, yeah. Someone said that uh, Larry Kelly says Duel is his second favorite Spielberg movie, which is wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a big Spielberg fan. I like a lot of his movies. Um, we went uh, the whole big part of my family went and saw West Side Story recently, and that was a little bit of a disappointment. Was it? I'm, 
Yeah, it it wasn't it wasn't very good. <laughs> it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It just wasn't. It, it just. I don't because know. It was, it, 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 there was no shark in it. Were in the sharks in it? Then they have. It this. just wasn't. It didn't feel like a Spielberg movie. It was. It was just. It was. It was. It was a little off. It just. You know, and, and I, I can see beyond the fact that they remade it. That's okay. It just. It just wasn't. It just wasn't very good. Hey, let's. Um, before we take a couple questions from from around the world. Uh, let me do one last quick um, sponsor break, and we'll come back. We'll do a, f- a few minutes, and, okay. and I know I think one of them, yeah, one of them coming up is uh, Charlie. Can we see some of your favorite collectible Jaws stuff? I don't have much here anymore. Really? Sorry. <laughs> All right, we'll be back in All a right. couple minutes. Be back in five. Okay. All right. All right, there you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics. The Organic Grill, the Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, and since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook or on Instagram. Come on now. Are you hungry? I know I am. Chacho's Tacos, located in Corpus Christi, Texas. Home of the Open Their Doors in 2001. Home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible home-style Tex-Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning. And in their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi swing by and get a home-cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos. We got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. Once again, I dedicate this show to the memories of Chris Corkum, Robert Bruce, and Scott Koenig. See you on the other side, my friends. Um, also just a reminder that the book is available, available at www.stonefilmsnyc.com. It is the New York Hardcore Chronicles, volume one, 1980 to 1989, a flyer oral history. There you go. It is free for patrons. Others can just buy it. Please support the show. Uh, people have asked about volume two. Volume two is in the works. Volume 2, 1990 to 1999. If you have flyers from the era of 1990 to 1999 and you would like to contribute to this project, this labor of love, please reach out. We're scanning scanning flyers now. Um, That said, uh, let me see. I think we covered a lot. I want to shout out. I want to shout out a couple of my patrons real quick. Real quick, I want to shout out uh, Marla Standing Owl, Duran Hayes, and Miriam. Uh, thank you for supporting me on Patreon. You make this whole thing happen, and I mean that. You make this happen. Is Charlie gone? For a minute, he's gone. He's coming back. Get your questions together for Charlie. Um, you know, that said... All right, let's go. Let me think. What else? All right, we're good. Let's bring Charlie on. Let's let's take questions uh, from around the world. Let me clear everything out of the way here. Uh, okay, let me get rid of all this stuff. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here we go. Hey, man. Hey, boss. Okay, let's see. Um, no joy. Ju- no Jaws memorabilia, huh? What, what, what is it all tucked away? Where, where does the barrel live? I, I swear, like I, like I said, I gave, I, I put some stuff in my friend Jeremy's house. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy Skorka? No, no, Jeremy Skorka. Man, no, of- Jer- <laughs> Jeremy Wagner. Um, okay. Yeah, Jeremy is, uh, he's in that band Broken Hope. He's a okay. huge, he's a huge Jaws uh, fanatic like I am. And uh, it's like, it's our bond, the Jaws right thing. 
Here, here's a here's a question from uh, from our from our boy Steve Messina. Any thoughts of the deep? Another classic that featured a nasty eel. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was something that happened after Jaws, and it was a lot of excitement about it because I think people thought it was going to be the next Jaws, but it really wasn't. Um, it, you know, it's like we don't even talk about it that much anymore. It's it's, it's of course uh, yeah. it's a Benchley book. You know, but and and Robert Shaw's in it. Robert Shaw's in it. I think Jacqueline Bissett is in yeah. it, and Nick Nolte, and Nick Nolte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nick Nolte, and 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 Orca, Orca, Orca was the big Orca, if I remember correctly, was the big sort of like let's let's get this done quick and let let's try to capitalize off the success of Jaws. Yeah, it, it's about a whale, and it it tried <laughs> tried so hard to be Jaws, but it just yeah. wasn't Jaws. But I, I would say that I did get a kick out of it. I, I liked it back in the day. Yeah, there was some cool stuff in it. I, I recently, fairly recently, uh, watched it again. It, it, Richard Harris, you know, it was Richard it was, Harris is in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah yep. And uh, and what's her name? Um, Charlotte Rampling. She's Charlotte a great, Ramp, great yeah. actress, man. And Bo Derek, right? <laughs> Yeah, Bo Derek is in that movie. She gets her. She gets her leg. She gets her leg bit by the by the whale. A whale. Yeah. It's so funny to think that Bo Derek was in that movie, and then what? A couple of years after that, she's running on the beach. With, sure. With braids. She was in. in Lo- she was in Logan's Run too, man. That's Remember right. Logan? No, Far- yeah. Farrah Fawcett was in. Oh, Logan's that's Run. right. That's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Before yeah. Bo Derek. Yeah. 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 Those, you know, Farrah Fawcett, right? Um, let me see what else we got here. Yes, Ireland in the house. Good. Yeah. Hey, man, how, how's everything in Ireland? Yeah, how's things in got, Ireland? They got hit, man. They got hit bad with COVID, too. Absolutely. Um, fact, Roy Scheider was drunk in most of the movie? I, don't, I haven't heard that. No, I think you're no, mixing him up with Robert, Robert Shaw. Shaw. Yeah. Robert Shaw. And, and and speaking, you know, speaking of the Robert Shaw thing a little bit, I guess after after the success, you know, and, and we touched on Frank Mundus, I guess, you know, he really sort of played that <laughs> angle, right? I mean, yeah, he really played that him. angle, right? <laughs> look at this guy. It's awesome. Yeah, I guess so, I mean, he really... Yeah, this he's a uh, so this Frank Mundus character. He's uh, he's legit. He's from Long Island, or is yeah. he from so Montauk? Is that where yeah. he would? Wow. Yeah, I he he was he was a hundred percent legit. Here's, I mean here here he is. He's a he's a little younger here, but he's you know, he's that char- He's the character, man. You know, he's the guy. Yeah. Yep. There hard he is drink hard drinking just you know, he's, fishing, got, he's got the po- he's got the he's got the hoop earring, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So I mean it seems that eventually, you know, when he wrote this book, he had a lot of people in mind who, who yeah. you know, the characters that were in this book. Um but the thing about Spielberg is like he took those characters and put them on the screen so that we could enjoy it, you know. It's like, that's another scene. Okay, so nobody really talks about this. So this famous scene where Hooper's, I mean, uh, uh, Robert Shaw, the Quint character, is sitting in his chair, right, fishing. After that whole scene plays out, that chair is gone. Where is that chair? Where does it go? It's nowhere on the boat. Did they just take it and throw it overboard? We don't need this. Oh, boat. oh, you're right. I never realized that. Like when they, when they, when, like when, when the shark is pulling them backwards and all that, they're at the back of the, yeah, the, the yeah. chair is gone. Right. The chair is gone. It's like, where is that chair? <laughs> that, that, that scene, that is such a great scene. Um, when, when, you know, Quinn's sitting there eating the crackers. And you, you hear the oh, reel go dude. click, click, and, and you see his eyes look at it, and he's you know, and he slowly straps himself in. Oh great. That's intense. And you know, the funny thing about that scene is he's eating this cracker and then it starts ticking, you know, 
click, and he looks down at it. He knows yeah. something's yeah. up, but he doesn't throw the cracker out. He puts the cracker back in his pocket for later. <laughs> I didn't notice and, that. I didn't notice that. That's great. It's like, <laughs> and I always wondered, like, what what those guys were eating, right before the the scene where he he, he talks about the Indianapolis. You know, they they eat on the boat. Oh, yeah, what, right. What did they eat? You know, the um, empty plate because the empty shit. plates the, the empty plates are right, sitting right. there. Yeah, it's like, is it fish? Is it meat? Where did they get the food from? Um, I thought it was steak. But they weren't My even. I thought it was steak too, but where? How did they cook it? Where? You know? Right. Right. These are yeah. all little things. Oh, here, here, here's a shot that that um, I neglected. I, I didn't. I didn't. When things started moving, a shot of you as a as a as a young person uh, eating popcorn. In popcorn at the movie. That was that was me basically on weekends going to the movies. Yeah. <laughs> yep. with, with my beetle haircut. Yeah. Uh, Hobo Cakes asks, Charlie, when is your art book coming out? Well, that's a that's a really good question. You know, we um, Anthrax, we did our graphic novel that came out this past year uh, with Z2 Comics. You know Josh Bernstein? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Josh's company, Z2, put out our graphic novel, and I got a chance to do some artwork for that, which I was so happy about. And um, But I... I I'm supposed to be doing an art show in LA uh, or I want to do one in LA because we, right. we were supposed to do one in New York and it got, got canceled because of COVID. We still want to do didn't one. You, in didn't you guys New York. do Comic-Con this year? Yeah. 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 It was, um, that was for the comic book, for the graphic novel. Chuck D was, uh, was there too with us. It was awesome. Um, right. But dude, it was so crazy com Comic-Con because it's like, I love those things and I couldn't walk around much because of the COVID thing. It's just like, eh. but we were there and we signed a bunch of stuff and met a bunch of people. And oh, I met the, the cast of the boys, which was awesome. I love that show. Yeah, I do too. Are they doing another season of that? Yeah. They were telling me about it. They said, if you like the, this last one, wait till you see this new season. It I can't like wait. It's taking them, it seems like it's taking them a really long time. Yeah, there's a couple of shows that production was halted. And, uh, like, there's this show that's based in New York called uh, The Marvelous Miss Maisel. You ever watch that sure. show? No, it's, I haven't. It's you know, so good, yeah. man. It's such a good show. And it's, like, old school, old time New York, like, in the late 50s. It just looks awesome. We're up um, on a thing called The Witcher now. We're watching this thing, The Witcher. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet. Um, yeah, I, it's, I, it's, you, I, got, you got to dig gotta, in, man. I got to start watching the new Cobra Kai. I started it last night, and uh, I got to continue. We saw the new Spider-Man movie last night. Yeah, we saw that too. It was, it was good. Yeah, and I'm not one for like, I'm more like I like the comics rather than the movies, you know. Sure. But uh, yeah, I like what they what they did with it. It was cool. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was cool. Uh, here's a question from our uh, resident historian, uh, Chucky Brown. Uh, can he speak on working on the soundtrack with director John Carpenter to the 2001 sci-fi horror film Ghost of Mars? One of the best weeks of my life uh, was spending a week with John Carpenter in the studio. Every day was just, uh, dude, I would sit down next to him and it would automatically turn it to an interview. You know, I was like, so when you were doing the thing, who had the thing at the end of the movie? Was it uh, McCready? Or, 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 <laughs> so I had to ask him all these things, but the best part about it was just creating and watching dailies of the movie that he did. And did, we would just create music from watching the dailies. And um, it was such a great experience and I would love to do it again. I love John Carpenter. John Carpenter is another one. Uh, someone mentioned it earlier about uh, the Halloween soundtrack and his sure. music. Sure. Awesome. Have you seen him perform live? He does that once I, in a while. Yeah, I did. He played here I, I in had, Chicago. I know he did it a couple years ago. Yeah. It was great. It was great. And it, um, he's another one of those guys, man. He just made movies that uh, just stand, stood the test of time. Halloween being one of them, probably in my top 10. That movie is just one of the greatest. I'm and a big, I'm a big, I'm a big, go ahead, go ahead. 
No, I was gonna say the thing I love about Halloween is um, the the Michael Myers is, is you know we all know Michael Myers is just evil, and he's just he's just that's that's what it is. And I love the one scene when he uh, the boyfriend when he just puts the knife through him and puts him up on the wall, you know, and then he just stops and stares at him like it's a piece of art that he just created. It's just it's sick, but. Yeah, Carpenter is uh, he made the thing, which is another one. That, that, I, I was movies. about to say, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the thing, and and I enjoyed the prequel too. That wasn't bad. Um, but I John did too. Carp- yeah, John, I love it because it stayed true. It, it really, you know, chronologically, they did a good job with it, and that's rare, you know. But you know, the the when when COVID first hit, I would always say is is the thing. Um, uh, basically everybody's going to get it. And, you know, um, but there's that one scene in the thing that always stood out to me is when they're testing the blood. Oh and, yeah. And when it jumps out, it, sure. dude, that is such an awesome scene. Uh, yeah. The thing is, is if you're a horror fan and you don't know the thing, then you're not a horror fan. And Rue on the loose says the score for Halloween and the thing was just as intense as yours. I love the music in, in the thing. I, I I love the soundtrack to the thing. It's really great that, that sort of. I, I do too. I do, but that, I think that's Ennio Morricone who did the thing. Um, okay. But while, while I agree with him that Halloween and the thing are just as intense as Jaws, I I completely agree with you. But there's something about Jaws that creates this whole fucking fear of the water that goes along with the music. Absolutely. Hey, let's go with this one a little bit. My most memorable Anthrax show was in December of 89 at Lemoore's in Brooklyn. They played a secret show under the name of Satan's Lounge Band. Any memories of Lemoore? And wait, I have I have the accompanying I have an accompanying photo uh, to go with it of, of Lemoore's to, just so we can set the table here. You know, this, this one kind of bring there you go. Right. So <laughs> the rock capital of Brooklyn. And I, I, I love, um, I love who's playing Megadeth possessed cities and then Ace Freely and Nazareth. <laughs> yeah, man. Everybody and, played Lamore. I mean, and, and you know, I, I got to say this, that I would always be a little jealous of like the Bay area because they had this kind of vibe, this, this community, this thing that was happening there. And I always felt like New York didn't have it, but then we did get it, you know, with places like Lemoore. And I remember going down to CBGB's for the first time and meeting certain people there and feeling like a part of that kind of scene, you know what I mean? A part of that community. And um, I would always be happy that ah, I found something here in New York, you know, because before for a heavy metal band in New York, it, it was there wasn't many if you remember you know the bands that stood out of course that came out of new york was ramones kiss the dolls um you know and then you you had a bunch of other bands that were kind of coming up at that point but i always looked to la and like san francisco like they had a scene there you know but that was our scene one more became that's what became the scene I don't hear Drew anymore. Sorry, my bad. You 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 guys played there a lot, correct? Um, we played there a handful of times, and uh, it was it was crazy because we we would load in early, and then we wouldn't go on till like fucking two in the morning. Yeah, man. Uh, what's his name? George and Mike Parente. They they'd, they'd had everybody drinking till till <laughs> till the end, right? Yeah, we'd be sitting in that dressing room like just. <sighs> Fall, fall, you know, but it was never that. It was never falling asleep because the, the dressing room would always be packed with people. It would just be like, it, it was always a thing, man. It, it was an event, you know, when, when, yeah. when we played Lamore. And um, yeah, it was it was great. It was part of our history, part of their history too. It, um, was, it wasn't a big venue, I would say. It was a yeah, club. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, but they would they would pack people in there. I remember one point, I mean, they had sort of like grandstands and like all the way in the back. Like they, they, like Paris Mayhew just, just posted up that me and Drew saw the chili peppers at Lemoore's. And wow. 
and uh, in my van. I, I remember seeing them, but thanks for reminding me. And I remember we saw the chili peppers a little more. It was packed. I mean, jam-packed in Lemoore's for the chili peppers. Everybody yeah. who came through had to play Lemoore. Yeah. You know, and yeah. do you remember Lemoore's East? On, on Queens Boulevard, yeah. On Queens Boulevard, yeah. <laughs> and apparently, I don't remember this, there was another one like out in Long Island, I think. Was there? I th oh. Yeah, let me, hold on, let me ask. Was there another Lemoore's out in Long Island or another one? Was there a third Lemoore's? Yeah, some, some, will, some will come up. I mean, I remember the Queens when I was there a few times. Uh, so loudness there for the first time. Hey, you know what? I w you know what? Until, until, oh, Staten Island. There was a Staten Island Lemoore's. Lemoore's Far East. Hey, shouting out Michael Gibbons. Shouting out Michael Gibbons from Leeway. I hope you're feeling better, buddy. I know you were you were laid up there for a while, and we're glad to see you back in the mix, buddy. Yep. Shout outs. We're giving shout outs. Hey. Yeah. I was talking to actually shout out to Warren. I was talking to Warren Lee yesterday. Oh, good dude. Hey Warren and his brother Royce, of course. Hey, you know when we were gonna do album of the week? Do you want to know what what I, I changed it? Do you want to know what my first choice was? Do it. <laughs> wow dude and I do you know I, and, and i this this is why i thought of this because i i guess it was 1990 i saw him play at the felt form at, at madison square garden i was there i looked down the row and you were standing about three people down from me so i remember <laughs> i remembered that and i thought this would be a great album of the week I know he was there. He was standing a person or two down from me. Yeah. Do you remember a couple of years later, like 93, maybe 92, 93, he did a He played the limelight. Um, and uh, he played an, another small place too. Um, and it was great because he did, uh, at the end of the set, he did a bunch of Smith songs. And um, I didn't see it that. It was great. Yeah. But he was great at the Felt Forum. That, that, that was, that was. That was really great. Um, I love, I love the, I love your symbols here. Tell us about these symbols. Oh, so those are the purple symbols that Peisty made. Yeah, Peisty made me okay, the, nice. a, a series of purple symbols because um, it, it has to do with my mom. My my mom's favorite color was purple, and once she passed, um, it's like it reminds me of her. So when I'm playing, I just you know it's 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 just that and it's they, they sound amazing and i see one of the greatest symbol companies and they make a, a great symbol have they been with you a long time i i'm loyal i don't i mean i've been with pisces since 86 i've been with tama since 86 wow Bickford. wow yeah, you know i i love what they make and i love the way it sounds so i can't change it that's awesome a uh, personal question: the 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 drum that is to the left of the hi hat under the cowbell. Yep. What is that? What is that used for? That's a twelve inch snare drum. Okay, so it's a second it just snare has a, drum. It's a higher pitch. Okay. Uh, I tuned it. I tuned it up a bit. Um, I see. And uh, yeah, so I mean, like I said, the cymbals are all pasty, and they they. I just love them. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if it was like a timbali. I, 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 I couldn't kind of figure out what 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 that was. No, I turn off the snare drums on it, and I kind of use it as a timbali. He says a side snare. Johnny Rock says, "Is that is Johnny that, Rock? Is that right? Side snare." I've never, I've never, I've never, all right, let me see if I have any other any other. Um, you know, I always like to go through the photos at the end. Uh, here's a, here's a shot of you with this is a this is a good one and and you know one of the iconic scenes in the film <laughs> on your shirt which is so funny why don't you come down here and jump some of this shit jump some of this shit <laughs> that is such a great scene. such a great that's, such a, that oh, scene dude. is great it's like that's the thing about movie making it's like if you can create these scenes and they're so effective and it's 
the one scene with the with the head that pops out, you know, that wasn't even shot when the movie was shot. That was done afterwards because Spielberg felt he could get another scare, another uh, jump type of thing, and he shot that in Verna Field's pool. He he talks about that in the documentary, which is yeah. uh, pretty interesting. So that I wasn't have, even in the I movie. I have that. I have that in my notes. Yeah, this is. Oh shit! No, it's the it's the. Hold on, let me let me get it right because this is this is really interesting. It's it's the uh, it's the Ben Gardner's head scene when when Ben Gardner's uh, head pops out of the uh, out of the out of the boat, right? This was shot in a that pool. Scene. Yeah, here it is. I got it. And this was shot in a pool. pool yep. Makes sense. Yep. And and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No wait. I got. I got. I got to find my notes on this because it's really, it's really great. Um, yeah. Okay. Spielberg, uh, Spielberg also decided that he was greedy for quote unquote, one more screen <laughs> and reshot right. the scene and reshot the scene in which Hooper discovers Ben Gardner's body using $3,000 of his own money after Universal refused to pay for the reshoot. The underwater scene was shot in Field Swimming Pool in Encino, California, using a latex model of Craig, Craig Kingsbury. That's the dude we can remember. Kingsbury. Craig Kingsbury's head attached to a fake body, which was placed in the wrecked boat's hull. To simulate the murky waters of Martha's Vineyard, powdered milk was poured into the pool, which was then covered with a tarp. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, Oh, I love it. Dude. Oh, that's a good that's one. You know what? Making. Yeah, that that's that. And, and you know what? Good for him because it is a really great scene. It is uh, that is another oh, really, really, really great scene. Uh, one thing we but haven't talked remember, about. Go ahead. No, I was going to say back in the day when they would do like um, screenings or they do mm -hmm. like they play a movie. No one knew what the movie was going to be like a test yeah. type of thing. Do they still mm -hmm. do that nowadays? Like like a like a like a screen test, you mean? Uh, like a, you know um, what I mean? Like uh, yeah. people would go to the movies and then they'd play another movie that they didn't know was going to be, you know? Um, yeah. Like a, uh, did they still do that? Because remember they would talk yeah. about the movie didn't test very well. Yeah. And they, they do it in a Hollywood still. They do it yeah. in Hollywood. There's there's private sort of there's there's small like they call them screening rooms now. Um, that that basically they they hire out. And they, they pick the audience and, and, and it's a little more controlled now. You know, they have more it, like that, a more kind of focus grippy type of thing. Yeah, right, right. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. And and when as a matter of fact, like when um when the Alago film that I directed came out, they, they Which I love. I love that, by the well, way. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And uh they 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 ended up doing a couple screenings in there and 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 you know, it, they're really nice and really expensive. You know, the seats are really nice and the, and the sound system is really perfect. And, you know, we did a couple screenings in, in, in Hollywood and uh, it, it, went, it went really well. And then the film went to Netflix and all that. So th th that was good, you know. That That's good. good, yeah. Yeah, the Iago film's getting a, a, a new life. It's going to be, uh, it, it's been off, it did three years on Netflix and then uh, it's been out of the mix and we just struck another distribution deal and it's going to get back out there again. So that's cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's cool. He's, I love, you know, um, um, I, I love that, uh, doc. And I, I love the agnostic front one too. Yeah, um, that's great. Uh, that, that, that one came out really good. Loved it. Yeah. Thank you. That, well, that, that, excuse me, that, that one was, was Ian McFarland's Ian, uh, Chucky in yeah. Ian, Ian, Ian McFarland. Yeah. Um, he was in the band uh, Blood for Blood. Chucky asks again, Drew, can he speak on the photo session he had with Freddy Krueger, Robert Englund, and did he, Robert Englund, ever get to hear the track Freddy Krueger? Yeah, he did. He actually uh, heard the track. Um, that was put together by the editor of Fangoria magazine back in the day. Right and um, I remember there was talk about New Line using the song Freddy Krueger for the Nightmare on Elm Street Part Three, but they gave it to Doc and Doc and got it, and um, we were pretty upset about that. But whatever, still a good song. Yeah, what was it? I remember the Doc Dream Warriors, right? We're yeah. the Dream Warriors. <laughs> yeah. I thought Freddy Krueger would have been better. 
Uh, Paris Bay previews, they're called. They're called previews. Yep. Um, yeah, but they, they don't do them anymore. Yeah, they still do, but not like they used to. It, it's more controlled out in Hollywood. They, they still do them. Uh, what's your what's your movie concession stand vice? Wow, I could tell you a crazy story though. The first time we went on tour and we played London, we had a night off and we went to the movies and I got popcorn and when I went to eat it, it was sugar, like sugar based. It wasn't salted and I, I almost puked. Uh, I was like, what the hell is this shit? I don't want like sugar corn i want salted butter you know yeah. it was the weirdest thing and and i remember we were freaking out because you could bet you could get beer too and, at the theater uh, at the movie theater so, so, at the movie theater yeah so that was kind of cool uh, yeah but the but the popcorn was horrible yeah um but yeah, go but ahead i will <laughs> do you remember goldberg's peanut chews that you would get at the movie come on of course those are the greatest and Twizzlers, Twizzlers and Goldberg's Peanut Chews. Well, you know, I, I'm here on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and, and uh, three blocks away, there's an AMC theater that has the reclining seats and all that, you know? So, you know, when my, when my kid was growing up, we, we would always go see, you know, the Marvel movies or whatever, and we'd always go first thing in the morning and go get, like, breakfast or whatever – and recline and hang and like when it was really empty <laughs> and just ha and just yeah. hang out and you know there's certain movies to me that are just you, you have to see in a movie theater you know they're they're made have to, to see see in a movie theater I mean sure you know I mean when I watch a movie here in the house it's like there's too much going on with the phone and the this and the that and I can pause it but there's just something about the spectacle. Of 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 being in, in a theater that's that's really a lost it, it's like a lost culture to a certain extent now which is very sad. Well, I mean the uh, the demise of the big the, yeah. the experience the movie experience when they started to make multiplex um, yeah. it was gone. You know, if you could yeah. go to a place and you get you could put ten movies in in each theater uh, that became the way it was. You know, everywhere you go to a mall you could. Pick, pick and choose either movie you wanted to see. But going to like, I remember sneaking out. We didn't go to school this one day. We went down to the Zigfield to see the song remains the same. Uh, and um, now, now we're talking the Zigfield. The Zigfield was, that was it. That was the experience. You go to the Zigfield to see a movie, you know? And, um, and always the first run theater, like the big movies would come into the Zigfield. Like, the the big bangers would go into uh, the dude, Zig field, exactly because it wasn't yeah. it was a movie experience. Um, yeah, so that's a great place to have seen the movie. The Zig yeah, field. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, here, here, now we're, we're winding it down. We're winding it down here. But um, uh, here's an interesting question: What was the first live show you went to? What was like the first concert you you went to? Oh, I went with one of my cousins. He was a photographer and he took me to see David Bowie back in the day. I was I was like nine years old. Wow. He was at the garden. Yeah. I'll never forget it. Wow. Huh. Did that, was my, that was my first ever show, David Bowie. Did Charlie ever go oh, to of course Interbor I did. That to was, Interboro? So, what is it called? The Interboro Four on East Tremont and Throg's Neck back? What, what was that? The the explain what is that? Uh, okay. So the Interboro Theater was a theater in our neighborhood, basically. And that's where we saw most of the movies. And I mentioned John Tempesta before. Me, him, yeah. my nephew, his brother, and all our friends, we would go to see midnight movies at the sure. Interboro. So sure. we would see um, Baby Snakes. We would see The Song Remains the Same. Come on now. Uh, the Yes yeah. songs. We would Yo, see uh, all these uh, Rolling Stone, movies. Sympathy for the Devil. Uh, yeah. Give Me Shelter. <laughs> Give um, Me Shelter. Right, right. Uh, the Wall. The, other, the Wall. Know? And yeah. then I would, uh, when I would go down the village or with, my, with my cousins, and we would always go see Rocky Horror at 8th Street um, and uh, Midnight. And those were another thing. That was a big event. And the crazy thing about that is two doors down from that movie theater is Electric Lady. And I'll never forget the first time we got to record an Electric Lady. And it was 
just that experience, man. It's like electric lady, you know, and there's the, I used to go wait online to see the Rocky horror right there. So that was, that was some of my favorite times. And there it is. Eighth street playoffs. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. You should bring this up because I'm, I'm working uh, um my new film project deals with, um, um, Electric Lady Studio and the A Street Playhouse. So I have this stuff right on my desktop right now. I was just editing this, editing this into a film today, and um, wow, it, 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 it's in my new project. And look at the midnight shows here: uh, Young Frankenstein Wednesday, uh, Song Remains the Same, Rocky Horror Picture Show Friday and Saturday, Sunday The Exorcist, Monday Clockwork Orange, Tuesday Alien. Aliens. <laughs> So we yeah. were, I remember they did a big uh, preview there for, do you remember the decline of the Western civilization? Oh, yeah. Part two, the metal years. Sure, they did. So they did the big event. Uh, we were in the studio. We were at Electric Lady and they were doing it that day, that, that night. And, oh, wow. Uh, what was her name? Penelope. Penelope Spher Spheris. Spheris. Yeah, Spheris. She, yeah, she did it. And, uh, yep. So anyway, but that's, yeah, dude, that was like, I swear, like my home back then just did you did you record there. did you record among the living in electric lady no no among no we recorded uh oh, we did state of euphoria right um there we did um a bunch of other records too at, at electric lady and uh do you remember the do you remember when um it's only rock and roll caught on fire uh -huh. across the street right Dude, yeah i never I just remember these things. Like I, I think you know, you know, tying it, tying in Scott Koenig. Scott Koenig used to work at It's Only Rock and Roll, right? Right. So Scott, the first time I met Scott, he was working at a record store. Uh, I think it was called. I thought it was. Called Maybe Things I got it wrong. What, was it no, not? but he. No, Scott oh. did eventually. He. Went I see. To, okay. Uh, it's Only Rock and Roll. Um, right. And I remember like recording and then taking a break and going across the street to see Scott and. You know, going around the corner and uh, to Bleak and Bob's and all that stuff. Is this, is this, I, I couldn't figure out, is this what Electric Lady, is this back then or is this current? That looks think... like, that looks like it's now. I mean, that looks yeah. like Studio A. That looks like the A room. Okay, got it. I have never been inside Electric Lady Studios. Yeah, it's a great vibe there, man. I mean, it, it, it's got, it's got some history, right? A lot of history, man. Zeppelin, it's, Hendrix. It's funny because I, I have. I'm looking at this folder. I'm telling you, I was I was working on this stuff. I was working on this stuff, you know, up until, you know, up until we we got going on the show. Here, here's here's another one. Boom. Eddie Kramer. Yeah. Now you guys worked with Eddie Kramer. Um, yeah. And it sort of went awry a little bit, right? But um, no, no. Is I that mean, not fair it, to say? No, no, that was just uh like uh one percent of the story. Um okay. and it wasn't it wasn't really a riot. It was like when it came down to mixing the record, Eddie wanted to do what he thought was gonna be the nineties mix. So he did a I mix see. for us and then when we heard it we were like, No, no, we don't want that because he wanted I guess more of like a a Def Leppard type of sound, and right. we didn't want that. We wanted it to be very dry and very boom in your face type of thing. So once we got past that, it was it was great. You know, recording with him was awesome. Must have been exciting to work with him, man. He's awesome. He's a legend. He's, he's yeah, one of the greats. Mean, yeah, re really incredible. Um, speaking of Among the Living, was the old man on the cover inspired by the film Poltergeist? No, not really. He was more inspired by the Stan, the Stephen King book. But right. the actor who played the preacher um, had such an effect on me that when I when I was when I met with the artist to do it, I I kind of like slipped it to him, like mm. you know that kind of image is something <laughs> that I'm like you know, and uh, and it, it just kind of went from there. So to answer that question, yes, a little bit. Yeah, that 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 makes that that makes Ju sense. Julian, uh, that was the actor. Julian, um, I can't remember his name. I want to say it's not Julian Temple. Not but, Julian. Uh, not not um. No um. Not the guy who was in Warlock, the movie Warlock. No, 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 no. I don't think that's him. But uh, yeah. 
Someone Charlie, will come up with it. Charlie, did you check out Get Back, the Beatles thing? Yes, yes, I've seen it. Like I have three yet times. to see it. <laughs> I have yet to see it. Any 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 words on that? Actually, we uh, I did a podcast with Chris Jericho and Mike Portnoy about it, and um, I mean, I loved it. I thought it answered so many unanswered questions about you know the Beatles and Let It Be because um, for me, Let It Be was the worst. I hated that time with the Beatles. Yeah. Um, and it's such a depressing documentary that they first made. And then this kind of enlightened enlightened me on how they were. It didn't look like they hated each other. It looked like yeah. they really didn't love each other, you know? So that yeah. was good. You should watch it. Yeah. I, I, and, I, and I did read about it that, you know, they really felt that the way that it was edited together initially just showed them in this light where there was nothing but conflict and they really didn't get along. And I, I think I read an interview with McCartney. He said, it, it really wasn't like that. I mean, that's the way they edited it. We had issues, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't bad all the time. You know? I mean, I think the reason why the Beatles broke up is because they lost their manager. He pretty much kept it all together. And I really think if someone stood up and said, look, Let's take a year off. Yeah. You could go you could go do your solo album. John, you could go do Yoko. I'm going to go do my own thing for a little bit and then let's regroup in about a year or two. And I I wish someone would have presented that to them. Maybe they uh that was the space that they needed. Can Charlie show us the Jaws Life magazine on his left? Uh sure. This was out. This is out just like uh, a year or two ago. Ah, it's great. You can probably find it on eBay. It's really cool. Um, nice. Still in plastic. <laughs> That's great. I have another one around here somewhere, but uh, my thing just died. My all earpiece right. just died. Can you hear me at all? I hear you now, just to my left, the right. All right, then let's. That's our. That's our cue to to wrap it up. Uh, was it Julian Beck? We were trying to uh, Julian Beck. That was it. That was it. That was it. All right. <laughs> well, hey, you know, I want to thank you. Uh, it was it was a really fun uh, Sunday afternoon, and we got to talk about uh, 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 something that we both have passion for, which which is this this in incredible film. Is there anybody that you want to thank or shout out on the way out? All right, just um, thank you for doing this. And uh, just doing this show is awesome. You know, uh, you, you bring a lot of people out and you, you talk about things that are, are, are really cool because nobody does it, you know? Thank you. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, the one thing we didn't talk about is, of course, the iconic art that is that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, the, 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 let, let me, let me. <laughs> Let me uh, let me bring it back up. Hold on, if you can hear me, we can, you know. Uh, I still hear you. Yeah. Um, let me get let me get that back up. You know, there was there's I had two of them, and I, and I brought that one up. You know, I didn't. Even, here, here's the other one, which is interesting because this one here is really, I think, this was what you would call the movie poster, correct? Yeah, I mean that's kind of what we would see. I mean, the other one is the art is the artwork, but this was really the oomph. This is really what, what we saw back then, but yes, please let's talk about it. I mean, just the, the artwork in, in itself, when you saw it, it just tells a story, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course that's the first scene in the movie. So the size compared to, you know, the yeah. shark, it, it's, it's huge compared to the girl. And I love the fact that there's just, you know, Jaws is in red, which is another thing that Spielberg did. He said anything, he doesn't want That's anybody right. wearing red in the right. movie. The only red right. he wants was the blood, yep. um, which is another thing. So, I mean, him planning this this story, this this movie, I mean, just little details like that, that, that means so much, you know? And just that artwork in itself is just beautiful because was, the original was there, cover. Was there a particular art like who 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 put this together? Is is there is there Roger one artist? Roger? Yeah, I think his name is Roger Cassell, mm -hmm. um, and he was the artist. Uh, he he's done other movie posters, but yeah. uh, I think this is pretty much his claim to fame. I mean, it's everything about this is perfect. It, it's amazing, and and I have some experience dealing with you know putting putting 
you know, uh, posters together for films. The simplicity of this, you know, is so it it it, it has so much how so much weight to it. You have red blood red jaws. You know the woman. You know the woman. You know swimming, which your perception is that she's naked. You know she's swimming, and you just have you know the monster coming up from the depths with 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 velocity. You know you see the bubbles like just like. Just it's yeah. like the mo the moment before impact. Exactly. And it's yeah. like the yeah. way he made it is like you know it's moving fast, uh because of the bubbles. And she's also moving fast as you can see because her legs are kicking. Um and yeah, it's just a perfect depiction of of that scene and what you're gonna expect if you go see this movie. Yep. Wanna shout out the director Ditto Montiel. How great to watch your show and your book is great. Thank you. Ditto, we wish you all the best out there in Hollywood, you know, uh, and we love your films, Ditto. Uh, Guide to Recognizing Your Saints, you know, is is still a go-to. It's great. And I know you're out there shooting uh, something new, so we wish you the best, Ditto. Um, awesome. Yeah. Ditto, yeah Ditto's, well, yeah. I would say, like, let's hope 22 is a very, very, very productive year. <laughs> Yeah, right. and, and, because it's like for me it's like i have my hopes for 21 and it was it was it was going good going good and then we ended it on a kind of a, a downer you know so um man you got to look out for each other let's let's make 22 great do you do you guys have um is, is there anything on the horizon we didn't uh, oh yeah tracks like like are you working on new material studio gigs yeah, working on <laughs> working on a new record, and uh, we're pretty much uh, we have a lot of songs, and we just have to get together a little bit more to yeah. really put the finishing touches before we go and record. You know, so that's where we're at. And your, your last record, to, your, last rec your last okay. record sounded great. I thought it was very. Uh, well I thought it was very well produced. I thought it sounded really great. It had a great sound. Oh, thank it. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's us and Jay Rustin. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, we hope to have this record out this year. Fantastic. All right, Charlie. Well, thank you so much. Let's let's uh, let's get something to eat and all the best to you and your family, man. <laughs> awesome, Drew. Next time I'm in New York, uh, let's go down to Katz's or something. We we will, buddy. Take care. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. Well, there you have it. The New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And our guest today was Charlie Benante. What a great show. That was awesome. Man, what a great show. I'm very fortunate that I have the opportunity to do these shows. And I appreciate those that support me. Uh, and I mean that. Um, you know, uh, what a great opportunity to, to, to talk about our love for film with someone like Charlie. Yes, Bob Riley, thank you, buddy, up there in, in Troy, New York. I hope everything is, is all right up there, you know? Um, thanks, Greg. Yeah, it was a great show. It was great. Thank you, Jay. You know, thank you, Greg. Thank you, everybody, man. Gregor, it was good. He was a great guest. Uh, who's up next? Um, you know what I didn't? You know what I didn't? The other, you know what? Here's another one. The other option for record of the week was going to be this, which I know really resonates with him as well. Um, this was going to be record of the week as well, because they covered Hey, Mike Pooch. What's up, buddy? All right. They covered a, a song off this record anthem on, 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 um, on one of their, um, I think it was a, I forgot what it's called. Cover me. Or I think they have a cover record. Um, this was, this was going to be, this was going to be, but, uh, we, right, Sid, right, yep. Sid. Yeah. You know, but you know, we did rush before. So again, yeah, yeah just a little something, a little different. Is that right? Alex Ramos, you're going to see Bill Buddhist tomorrow. Bill Buddhist is still alive. <laughs> Apparently. Wow. Alex Ramos, where are you seeing Bill Buddhist down in Florida? Wow, I haven't seen Bill Buddhist in 40 years, man. Right. Interesting. Anthems, it's called. Yeah. Anthems. That's interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I used to use that line when we used to do the music videos together. And we were over, if, if, if ever we, we go look at it, we were overwhelmed. I say, fuck, we're going to need a bigger boat in, in production. That's like, oh, man, we're going to need, we're going to need a bigger boat, man. So that was a great show. You know? <sighs> is that right? Anthem is the main influence for the song Signs of the Times? Wow. Boy, Chromag's got, Chromag's, uh, Max had some metal, some metal roots. Alex Ramos, I don't think Bill Buddhist wants to talk to me, man. Me and Bill Buddhist had a me and Bill Buddhist had an ugly falling out 40 years ago. So I don't think I've never spoke to Bill Buddhist since. Bill Buddhist was one of my beloved childhood friends, and it ended up really ugly. As a matter of fact, out in Long Island one night it was an ugly night. But we won't get into that on this show. Um Sign of the Times is basically anthem backwards. Wow. Hmm. hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yep. All right, Sid. Take it, Sid. Good to good to have you back in New York. Definitely. Hey, look. I said I'm glad to be home and won't be leaving anytime soon. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Cheers, guys. Yeah, we had a fallout. Bill Budis was one of my closest friends growing up um, as a kid, as a young teenager in the Bronx. And yeah, something happened one night. It got real, real ugly. And uh, we've never spoken since. Um, it was, it was ugly. He wanted to fight me. And it was a bizarre, bizarre, one of those bizarre evenings, man. Um, yes. Great show and happy new year. Well, thank you. Who, wait, who's up next? Um, tune in. There is no show on Wednesday. We're going to do a Patreon-only show on Wednesday, so look for that. Uh, coming up a week from today, January 9th, is Jay Navarro from Suicide Machines. Let's, let's get some West Coast going, people. Um, we'll get some West Coast going a week from today. That should be cool. Looking forward to it. Um, that said, see anything else? No, no, it wasn't over a woman. It was not over a woman. It's very complicated. Uh, this is one of my dearest friends. We did stuff together, you know, when you're a young teenager and something just happened one night and it just went bad. Um, it just went really bad. It wasn't, it was not a woman. It was not a woman. Listen, you know, when you're... When you're a young teenager, you know, you know, I, I, I take my, I, you know, I'm responsible for, I'm responsible for my part in it. It just, there's no sense in getting into. It's going back 40 years. This is someone I love. This was someone I grew up with, and and did those things when you were a teenager. You know, those discovery things. You know, 13, 14, 15 years old, going to concerts, doing juvenile delinquent stuff. Riding the trains at two in the morning. You know, this was this was like, you know, life is short. This is 40 years ago. I've never heard from never it was such an it ended so ugly. It was such an ugly night where you know, you know, it, it was ugly. You know, ugly. So it still sticks in my head what an ugly fucking night that was. Um, yeah. Well, say hello for me anyway, Alex. Tell, tell him I remember the good times. Tell Bill Buddhist I remember the good times growing up. I, I really do. Um, so, yeah. This show was dedicated to the memory of Chris Corkum, who passed away, who loved this show very much. Also, Scott Koenig, who managed Biohazard. Um, I'm going to his funeral tomorrow. Very sad. And also, rest in peace, Robert Bruce from Comic Book Men, who was a friend Robert Hogg, Drew, we can't change the past, but we can write our future. That's right, buddy. That's right. Absolutely, we can. So there you have it. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. Until next we meet, do good things, and good things will come to you. <laughs>